General Porter, welcome. Thank you for being here with your staff. Hey, thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman. Appreciate it very much. Honored to be here. Ready to go? The floor is yours. All right. Thank you, sir. I, I, I got the uh, high sign. Let's not uh, have a lot of fluff and get right to the meat of this, sir. I think I'll just start with a couple of quick updates and then uh, sort of set the stage, and I'll turn it over to Mr. Shope to, to go through our four exceptions. Uh, very quickly, appreciate uh, all the support from, from this body and our, our legislature on the skilled nursing. Um, appreciate everybody that was uh, attended the grand opening of the, uh, this last uh, summer. Um, that meant a, a great deal to, to our veterans and, and it certainly wouldn't have happened without this body's support. So thank you very much for that. You know, I will continue to tell you that the Wyoming Military Department remains uh, very busy. Um, the governor, myself, and a few of our staff uh, over Thanksgiving had a chance to go to Tunisia, our partnership country, uh, met with the prime minister and some of the uh, ministers of interior, uh, education, agriculture, and defense uh, to see how we can further that partnership. And then we slid over into Kuwait and had an opportunity to spend Thanksgiving with uh, some of our soldiers that were deployed there. Um, again, it will come as no surprise to you that they're performing in an outstanding man manner. They're part of a combat aviation brigade uh, currently deployed there and uh, doing some great work. Um, they'll, we'll see them uh, coming back here probably into May, first part of June. But I will tell you the deployments won't stop. The military department will continue to, uh, to support the national effort. Uh, I think we'll see the, the 153rd Airlift Wing will deploy next fall. Uh, we'll have about 140 personnel deploy in that particular uh, deployment. And I think we'll look to see another battalion, maybe two battalions um, deploy um, next year sometime as well, although that's that uh, note of that notice of deployment hasn't officially come down yet. So you'll continue to see our soldiers and airmen and the National Guard be uh, be ready to deploy. As a sort of a, set, a scene setter of of uh, our exception requests and what you'll see um, in some of our bills that come forward during this legislative session, uh, assuming that they 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 get there is this discussion about strength and recruiting in the military department. And actually you can, you can expand this nationwide. It is a nationwide um, issue at the moment. I provided a set of slides to you just to, to, to sort of I said, set, the, set the scene for you. Um, as you can see, you know, 2018, 2019, we really started to, to increase strength. Um, starting in 2020, the Army National Guard was at about 100% strength, uh, doing very well. The Air National Guard had uh, an increase of about three to 4% um, over that, that year, really good solid growth of what we needed to do. My goal is to be at 102% strength. Um, if we look at uh, the fight that we have coming next to us, be a, a peer or a peer plus competitor, um, we're not gonna be able to use the same mobilization uh, methods that we used before. Before, since we were kind of going out piecemeal, I was able to cross level, or we were able to cross level across the, the units and able to send full units out. I'm afraid if this next fight goes, we're gonna have to send everybody that can go, and we're not gonna have the luxury of cross leveling across the, uh, the, the formations. We'll have to be able to support the president's uh, actions, and we'll also have to be able to support the governor here in the state, because frankly, I don't believe that uh, we'll be uncontested here in, in, in the homeland if, if we go against a peer competitor. So we'll have to have personnel to be able to do that as well. So I'm very serious about the, our, my goal to achieve 102% strength because I think we're absolutely gonna need it in order for us to perform our missions. So 2020 hit, COVID started, uh, um, started to happen and the mandate came down and certainly in Wyoming, um, those of you are, are very well aware that uh, that that wasn't well received and that that also it exhibited itself in our ranks soldiers and airmen uh, didn't want to uh, many of them let me say that many of them did not want to 90 percent of our forces vaccinated um, most of the soldiers and airmen did uh, did get their their vaccinations but we certainly had a few that, that did not um right now i tell you there's 54 soldiers that are hard nosed i will not take the vaccination there's 54 religious accommodations on the army side that are going through there's about 22 hard nose on the air side and what, Chris, 50, 50 and change religious, yeah, 52 um, religious accommodations that are going through. If those were to be denied and, and uh, those soldiers and airmen get out, it's really going to impact strength significantly. You couple the COVID mandate with a general sense across, particularly in Wyoming, where 
Um, most of our, our residents are not fond of the current administration. You know, frankly, I'm not telling you anything that, uh, that you don't know. Um, that trickles down into some of our, our parents and influencers recommend that they don't join the military because of that. And then, uh, and, and then just, just the fact there's a lot of competition out there in that space of uh, trying to get talent, just like everybody else is getting. So it really has put uh, a significant decline on our, our, our strength. And this is actually felt nationwide now. Um, both Army, the Air Force, the Department of Defense in total have come to the realization that uh, they're going to have to do something different. They're a little slow to it. And what you'll see today in, 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 in the legislation, you'll see most of our asks are targeted either recruiting more soldiers and airmen or retaining those that we have. And uh, that's that's the purpose behind uh, what, what we're going to be talking about to, today, by and large. Before I turn it over to Mr. Shope to kind of run through our, our short list of exceptions, is there any questions that I can answer along those lines before we go? Any, any questions about the introduction before we get into the supplementals? Senator Salazar. Okay. We're, we're, what we're trying to do is make sure you have the time to get through your supplementals and then we circle back for questions first on the supplementals and then just generally. Yes, sir. Sounds good. Generally general. Yes, sir. Okay. I, I generally Thank have you. it. Yes, sir. All right, let me turn it over to Mr. Shope, our deputy director, and he'll he'll walk through uh, the supplemental request. Good afternoon, Mr. Chairman. So I'd like to start out on page eight and just briefly go through the priority list. Um, we will uh, brief in the priority list with the Challenge Academy request last. Um, and then if time permits, we'd also like to have a fifth, a, a fifth item of discussion of a previous appropriation. And with that, I'll just jump right into our recruiting and, and marketing request, priority number one on page 17. This request is for $172,500. And it is focused at several areas of recruitment. And you can see those items under a, and that's local billboards, movie theater advertising, sword and shield branded advertising material, event registration, and hosting events to publicize knowledge and operation of the military department. And so with that, I really have no further explanation um, unless there are questions. Representative Larson. Movie theater advertising? <laughs> Mr. Chairman, is that? Please, please, General. Yes, sir. That's uh, that's um, some of our smaller towns. One of the uh, uh, one of the uh, vectors that we talked about. But but frankly, a lot of this, as as we uh, as we recognized in the pre brief, you know, we're really going to be focused more in, in terms of TikTok, Instagram, those kind of places. Um, right now, the federal government doesn't allow us to use TikTok because the servers are in China and there's a prohibition to do that. So. Uh, um, I can't do it with any federal funds right now. That's why we're asking for some from state funds um, as just to broaden that concept. That's really the discussion here in Wyoming. Most of the recruiting at the two service levels in the Army and the Air Force are done through a national contract. And they are really focused in their centers of influence and where they get the most of their enlistments. Wyoming is not one of those. So on the first, you know, I have to do something, I think, to, 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 to change the, the math to get more recruits into the Wyoming Guard. And they're frankly not going to help me that much. And so we're going to try to tailor it more towards Wyoming, serving the Wyoming way and that theme. So you see the billboards. I think there's a question on that too. Although I will tell you every time I go down I-80 and I see the Marine billboards up there, it always makes me mad that, hey, that should be us. We, we should be advertising ourselves. So there's a lot of different things that I think we're gonna try here to see what we get the return on investment on and see what becomes effective for us. Follow on, uh, uh, hang on a minute, Representative Walters and then Representative Schwartz. Thank you, following up on that. Have you done any research to see what the results are of your advertising campaigns to know which ones are the effective ones, you know? So you see the, the Marines billboard makes you mad that it's not you, but it doesn't matter if no one calls your office uh, regardless just because you have it up there. And so what are the results you're seeing from these various um, methods and and I think your description in, in here, sword and shield branding on T-shirts, backpacks, coffee mugs for $100,000 seems, does not seem like an effective use of good marketing campaign. Like the marketing idea, understand where you're coming from. But I, I guess I'm not convinced yet that this is a good targeted uh, marketing campaign. 
General. Mr. Chairman, you know, first off, we haven't implemented any of this stuff yet because we don't have the resources to do it. So I wouldn't be able to tell you what, what the return on investment is on those. I, I will tell you, you know, over the past, you know, we've been deploying for 22 years as a National Guard. We've been very focused on that mission. And I think as part of that um, effort, we sort of lost touch with the community. We've, we've, we've drilled more in Guernsey and we've, we've drilled, because we're deploying, we drilled less at the home, at our home stations. And I think we've sort of disconnected to some extent with those folks. So when I say backpacks and that sort of thing, it's also sponsoring a, a, a softball tournament. It's also getting our name out there back into our communities. Because what we realize is the recruitable age is, you know, 17, 18, 19. But really, most people make the decision about whether they, they want to, they're interested in the military at a very young age, five, six, seven, eight. I know in my own self, it was, I was six years old when, when I saw folks rappelling out of a helicopter. And I thought, maybe that's something I want to do. So we're putting some more investment and thought into that, which I will tell you the national level hasn't hasn't done yet. So um, if to 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 get after it, if uh, if I can give you a much more detailed marketing plan, I think by the time we get, if we want to do that, but I haven't we haven't done it yet because we haven't had the money to do it. Representative Schwartz and then Representative Sherwood. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. So, General, it's good to see you again and see you, sir. in the flesh instead of an 0700 Zoom. <laughs> um, yes, sir. So we talked somewhat about the advertising yesterday, but when you mentioned the Marine Corps billboard, mm -hmm. I'm wondering, do you have data that shows what recruitment to the other uh, parts of the military are in Wyoming? And can we have any sense of what their advertising campaigns are and how effective they are. General. Mr. Chairman, we do have a sense of who goes, you know, Marines. We, Wyoming National Guard owns about 40% of the market share of the DOD market. So we're doing pretty well in the, the market share. Um, so that means that for four out of every 10 folks that are across the Department of Defense, they come to the Guard. Marines are probably the biggest competition in places like Cody, um, to some extent, Campbell County and Gillette. They have a pretty strong foothold there. Why they're successful, I, I, I don't have data to tell you why their recruiting campaign is, except they, call, you know, the Marines particularly call to a, a particular type of individual and culture. And I, I just think that, that, that they're found there. Please. So do we know if they're having similar recruiting reductions as the National Guard is? Mr. Chairman. Please. Uh, Representative Schwartz, yes, it is. It is a it is a nationwide problem right now. Representative Sherwood and then Senator Salazar. Thank you. Hopefully, this is a resource to support this conversation. Um, the University of Wyoming has a very um, robust communication and journalism department. Um, if you haven't already, to reach out to Cindy Price Schultz, who is the supervisor of internships there. I'm happy to give you her contact information. They have done incredible work um, for different nonprofits and organizations in Laramie in developing marketing strategies and then uh, helping measure those. Thank you. Senator Salazar. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, yeah, I just want to, I, I totally agree with you, General, with regard to recruitment. Um, when I come home, my 14 year old wants a mug and he wants the National Guard mug and, and those chains and things. And it makes, it makes young people think. Um, I, but isn't our greatest recruitment tool other soldiers? Word of mouth. I know that's what um, that I see all the time um, happening. And and then I'll finally just anecdotally, when I saw Top Gun, I went to a recruitment station. Yes, sir. General, Mr. Chairman. Yes, sir. I, I, you know I agree. We're still finding that the number, the top two reasons people join is service and education. Those are the top two reasons that they, they that we, so we can't ignore that um, as, as we continue on. Thank you, sir. Representative Zwanitzer. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, General, could you tell me how much or how many or what percentage uh, of your personnel comes from out of the Wyoming boundaries? And then I may have a follow-up. Who, oh, um, uh, Mr. Chairman, uh, Representative Zwanitzer, I, I probably couldn't. I tell you, it's a little higher on the air guard side because of what we do. Probably, say, Chris, 20 percent. Yeah, closer to thirty percent on the air guard side because of the the aircraft mission. The army's a little less, probably fifteen percent. But I'll I'll get you the exact number, sir. Follow up, please. Uh, and then uh, for this exception, 
is that money planning on being used in the state of Wyoming or are you looking of going out of the state because you know the pickings are a little better there? Yeah. Mr. Chairman, yes. Representative Wanted, sir, it's definitely in the in the in the state of Wyoming. I, I really have a lot of help from the services outside of, of the state. It's it's within the state and trying to get that, you know, people still I met a person yesterday that didn't realize that the National Guard deployed overseas. And 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 I got to, I got to get, I got to get that information out to, to, to the, to the folks out there. And that's, and that's, that's my job here in, in within the boundaries of the state. Thank you. Bit of housekeeping. Uh, originally you were scheduled one to two. Now it's 1230 to 130 and you got 40 minutes and three more requests. Anything else on the advertising before we move on? Please general proceed. Mr. Chairman on page 18. Um, I want to point out the governor's recommendation for this request. This is a biennial amount that we need to jumpstart this program, and it is not to be biennialized for the 25 biennium. The next request, Mr. Chairman, is on page 21, and this is our educational assistance uh, for tuition and fees uh, for in-state um, higher uh, uh, education. $250,000 request. Um, if you remember, during the first, during the uh, biennial appropriation, we increased the amount by 400,000. And so this is an additional 275,000 for the entire biennium. And the amount has went up after a decade of a few reductions. The amount has went up because our recruiters are significantly pushing the education amounts because of the restrictions on the GI Bill at the federal level. They're pushing this education uh, tuition and, and fees uh, significantly. And, and our forces, you know, and they're, and they're uh, recruiting younger folks that are just beginning to get into their higher education. So it's, it's being used significantly more. Thank you. So this is they can they can take advantage of this while in the guard, not after discharge. Right. Okay. Questions, comments, the panel on this supplemental request. All right. Please proceed, Mr. Mr. Chairman. To to complete this one on page twenty two, the governor has recommended approval of this two hundred and seventy five thousand. And again, this is a biennial amount added to what we currently have, and is not to be biennialized in the twenty five uh, biennium. All right. Next request. Um, Mr. Chairman, I'd like to go to page 29. This is our civil air patrol request. Um, during budget reductions, we defunded the civil air patrol and have, and even though we knew it at the time, it was a lower priority, but it is, it is a significant detriment to not have these funds for our civil air patrol in virtually every category. And you can see those object code categories there from uh, equipment repair and maintenance, a little bit of travel, a little bit of airplane maintenance, which is primarily the responsibility of their federal budget, education supplies for the youth to recruit these uh, pilots, um, repair and maintenance supplies for the aircraft, as well as the real property rental, which is a significant amount because we house all five of those in hangars um, to keep them ready to to uh, launch if we have an, have an issue. And so that's the, the minimum that we believe that we need. Um, in about 2008 to 2011, we maxed out the budget for this at a, at a little over $200,000. And that's when we know times were good. We had um, a lot of pilots we had that were getting training time. Uh, because of the fuel that we could provide with these funds, and as well as the recruiting the youth, but now that has shrunken all the way back to to it's it's significantly impacting them. And then I'd like to further go on to page um, thirty, and the governor has recommended this request, and this is an amount that would be biennialized um, up to ninety thousand, twice the amount for the next biennium. Representative Schwartz. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And I don't usually do comments, but this, this will fall into that category. I wanna thank 
the agency and the general for putting money back into civilian air patrol. It's been something I've talked to them about in the past. Um, in my part of the state, it's pretty critical to have civilian air patrol. Uh, the nature of our search and rescue operations often requires it. We're covering a lot of square miles. And my hope is that this is a great start, but that we will get the funding level back up to where it was historically. So thanks again. Uh, Councilman, Councilman, had a flashback to Mayor, <laughs> Representative Walters. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mayor, Mr. Mayor. <laughs> uh, how much does, do the, does the federal side contribute to this program? Sir, uh, Mr. Chairman, I'm sorry. Please. Uh, Representative Walters, I, they, they contribute some, some basic, um, uh, like pay, pay for the, well, it's all volunteers. So, hey, Doug, I, it's. Mr. Chairman, uh, Representative Walters, they provide for all these categories since we have backed out of them, but I can't tell you what their total budget is. We don't see that. And so when. Yeah, Chris can though. Okay. Mr. Chairman, I'm Chris Smith, the uh, general counsel for the Wyoming Military Department. And in answer, uh, Representative Walters, I don't have the actual budget amount, but the, the problem with the Civil Air Patrol that some of, some of the members may recall is the Air, the Air Force, the DOD pays for a base level of maintenance, a base level of flying hours. And it really, in the opinion of some of the CAP leadership, isn't enough for the missions they actually fly, because they're usually flying crummy weather, mountainous terrain. It, it, so back, back in the 2008 region, there was an accident involving a CAP plane in the legislature uh, generously provided additional money to make sure it would never happen again. We've had to cut back on that. So what this does is basically supplement the federal money which is limited to make sure the pilots have totally airworthy airplanes, have lots of hours in the airframes for their mission. So I don't know the actual dollar amount. We can certainly get that to you, but, but that's what this does is to add to the very base level that the Air Force provides. Uh, anybody else on Civil Air Patrol? Okay, before we circle back to uh, Cowboy Challenge Academy, which may take some time, I wanna see if there's anything else on any of these supplementals. Anyone? I'll just I'll just ask a I'll, I'll just ask a question. Uh, you had me going on the uh, advertising until I saw T-shirts, mugs, because mm -hmm. you were you started out talking about TikTok, mm -hmm. and you couldn't use federal dollars because the feds won't let you do that. So I thought you were going to have an active campaign on other social media, and I don't see in your plan anything for social media. And so I I, I mean I'm I'm not a big believer in mugs, but I've seen the power of social media, and I, I'm confused because you started out TikTok as the rationale for the thing, and then we segued to mugs. Thank you, um, Mr. Chairman. So we've got a pretty good social media presence through our through our federal, you know, the, the our federal funding for that. So we can we can hit Instagram, we can hit Twitter, we hit Facebook, um, our, our web. We we we've got money to do that. Where I don't have money for is TikTok for that because they won't let us on that one. And that's where the kids are. So I definitely want to take some of the state funds to, to, to do that. But as I said, I'm really trying to focus the recruiting on the Wyoming Guard and serving the Wyoming way and establishing that and sort of distancing ourselves somewhat from the two services because in Wyoming, that makes some folks mad. So I want to show about our competitive advantage in the Guard is that we serve our communities and we serve at home. And so that that doesn't you know we have two steep TV stations in 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 the state of Wyoming, and we have to figure out other ways to get the word out in those communities out there. Social media, is some of it, but you have to keep refreshing content because it gets stale very quickly. And so we want to augment with that sort of thing. And as I said, with TikTok, so there's a lot of different ways that we're going to approach this. This is, I think, our first sort of dipping our toe in about all right, where where can we be successful? What what's uh, what's going to get us the, the best return on investment and and that's where my my head is at sir okay i'm still struggling but anybody else where we circle around to cowboy challenge academy 
All right, let's, let's go back to Cowboy Challenge Academy, which I think is on page 25. And uh, so we have some, some uh, we have some members of the committee that aren't necessarily familiar with this. And so if you could take just three minutes on a high level overview of, of what it is and what happened. And, and you're, you've got it in here in reaction to a legislative footnote that's outlined on page 25. Yes, sir. And I'll, I'll probably refer to my testimony in front of Joint Transportation um, back in November. But uh, what I will tell you um, very quickly, we started Class 46 in the first part of July um, with the intent that, you know, it's going to go drive on as normal. Um, approximately three weeks into the, the start of that um, class, there was also a, an inspection from National Guard Bureau that occurred. And they came in and, take a, and took a look at People, what Cowboy Challenge Academy is. Sure, I'm certainly. sure people know. Yep. So the Cowboy Challenge Academy is uh, a program for at-risk youth. They cannot be court-ordered to go to the uh, to the facility, and we really don't provide much in the sense sense of uh, uh, if you um, if you have uh, too much of a mental disorders that sort of thing. We don't we don't provide those sort of things. The intent of the program was really to get after those um, students that were at risk of dropping out of high school and not getting a diploma. And so the purpose of the, the Cowboy Challenge was to provide either through credit recovery, we, we get them spun back up, bring their um, high school credits back to uh, the level um, that they needed and return them to the high schools that they came from, or we provided a high, a, a high school equivalency, um, high set, formerly known as a GED. That could be done through um, through the Cowboy Challenge as well. Um, it is a program that is 75% funded federally and 25% funded by the state. Although, if we want to get to the history, that we've, we've changed that a couple of times in Wyoming. But that's the primary purpose of it. And it's run through the Department of Defense with the executive agency being the National Guard Bureau for the National Guard. There's about 32 programs uh, in, the, uh, in the United States. And uh, ours has been in existence for about 17 years. And then I'll just, we'll, we'll pick up the narrative, but just a couple other things that I think may be pertinent, those just late, mm -hmm. to the, late to the game is, part of it was in Guernsey, and you're having trouble attracting staff. And then there was always this question, is it a corrections function or, or is it a military function? And, and I, I remember that being part of the discussion. You don't need to respond to that. I just remember that was part of the debate. Yes, sir. So go ahead and pick up. I think yes, sir. It, it was entirely in Guernsey. The, the program was entirely Guernsey. It was uh, located on our, our training uh, facility there or in, in Camp Guernsey. Um, as I said, we started uh, our class, our 46th class, uh, had the inspection probably the first part of August. We got the results back and, and they, they did not fare well. They, they, they failed the inspection pretty, pretty badly. Um, we took a look, uh, sat down with the director, um, really agreed that uh, maybe it's time to, uh, you know, he, he was eligible to retire. So he, he made that decision. And then at that time, I detailed uh, Colonel Holly Schenefeld, our, my joint chief of staff, uh, a colonel with about 30 years experience up to the program to say, all right, we got to get us to uh, through um, the graduation of this class. And then we need to hire a new director. So that was uh, the guidance. Once she got up the ground up there and started assessing uh, what was going on, uh, we had quite a bit of absenteeism on, a, on, a, on our inability to uh, attract um, employees to come and, and serve there. That was part of the great resignation, part of the, you know, increase in gas. Most of our employees don't live in Guernsey. They commute to it. And uh, we were having quite a bit of uh, absenteeism in, uh, in employees, uh, maybe one to two per day. Um, I asked the governor if we could put seven soldiers and airmen on the state active duty to uh, to try to get us to the end of of December and graduate this class while we were trying to hire a new director and 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 drive on. Uh, he he did that and and we we continued to try to get the class to to go on. At that uh, at that time though, we continued to to lose employees whether it was family medical leave act, disciplinary actions and those kind of things and we could not replenish them. In time, it, it takes a little bit of time to train somebody to come on at-risk youth. And so about the 13th of September, I really came to the decision that I could no longer ensure the safety of these minor um, uh, cadets entrusted to our care. And uh, I didn't know what was going to change in the next month to a year in, in terms of being able to attract more employees. 
So I went to the governor and I said, sir, I think, I think we need to uh, return these cadets back to their, to their guardians. Uh, I, I cannot ensure that, that we can, can do a safe operation here. And uh, he concurred with that. Uh, I went up to, uh, to the uh, Cowboy Challenge on the 5th, 13th of, 14th of September and informed the employees, of which there was about 35 at the time, that we were going to shut it down and told the cadets that, that they were going to, uh, that we were going to return them to their guardians. At the same time, uh, the team really started to do a great job. I really gave them not much time to, to work, but they started to, uh, to find other programs that could take the cadets. So about half of our cadets went to other programs in California, in uh, Montana, in Idaho. Um, the, the Nevada um, program offered to give us some assistance. They did not have a class going on at the time because they were trying to get their feet back up underneath them. So they sent us some assistance up. And then we returned about 30 of them back to their guardians with, with computers so that they could continue on with high set, pr pretty much like we did during COVID. So, uh, so that's, what, uh, that's what started um, that piece and, uh, and the ultimate decision to, uh, to, to close the program because simply can't get enough of the right people in Guernsey to, to operate a 24 by seven uh, operation for at-risk youth. Um, it's fairly complex. You know, it is a no contact facility, which means you cannot, they're there voluntarily. It's voluntarily there. You cannot put your hands on them. You cannot restrain them. You cannot keep them from going anywhere. If they want to walk out, walk away and, uh, and leave, they can do that. Unfortunately, they're in our care. So our TTP or our tactic is we, we send a, cadre person after them while they're walking, while they're, while they're leaving. We try to get a counselor with them and it doesn't take too many runners before you don't have any more people. And so it was just that continued real, realization that we just don't have enough people to, to do it safely. And that's what led to that decision. Sir. Representative, go ahead. Thank you. Major General Porter, thanks for coming in today. So I, I fully understand the need to relocate these students, and I'm glad you're able to relocate a lot of them and successfully do that. I understand our financial responsibility for paying for those students. My question for you is going forward, will you be recruiting more students or will this financial responsibility end when these students graduate? Mr. Chairman? Please. Um, sir, the, at least for this next class, we have about 22 Wyoming kids that Nevada has agreed to, to take in this next class, free of, free of no 25% match for that. If we were to, uh, and, and we thought that we obligate, because we had recruited those families before, and so we thought we had an obligation to, to continue to service them. If we decide to continue with a longer term relationship, we would have to make the decision to fund 25% match and then whatever else it took. So, but if we decide not to, then we, we, we would know that. There is a one year um, follow on from the res, we have a 22 week resident phase, and then there's a one year mentoring phase after that. Um, you'll see that's part of the, the, the continued expense is for class 45 and 46, we feel that we still need to, to provide that mentoring to them for that year program afterwards when it's, when it's done. Follow on, please. Thank you. So your request actually is to reimburse the governor's special contingency fund. So this money isn't going to go to you. The governor's already covered that expense. You're going to reimburse that fund. That's what this request is all about. General. Mr. Chairman, sir. Yes, that is a part of it. But again, um, we use the governor's special contingency fund because we didn't have the authority to move money from our 100 series where the bulk of the appropriation is to the 900 series to pay for those other states. And so at this stage, we've already paid Idaho and Montana. We have yet to pay the $196,000 due to California, but we anticipate doing that very shortly. And we just did not have the ability to make any of those payments. As well as we determined we didn't know on, in addition to personnel funds, the other expenses that we would incur in closing this program at Guernsey. And so for the balance of the biennium, we're requesting to gain that authority to use the 100 series, move it to 200 and 900 series, and complete the program 
um, through the end of the biennium, June 30th of 24. It's on my phone, it's on my watch. Representative Larson. So General, I'm a, <clears throat> I'm a little confused and would appreciate some clarification because over the past few bienniums <clears throat> since being in the legislature, when we've had conversations about the Cowboy Challenge, we always was under it's it's a it's funded majorly by by majority by federal funds, and we had kids from other states <clears throat> participate in the program. And we inquired multiple times, well, can we charge those states for those kids? And was told, no, we can't do that. And so we've never, and and you can correct me if I've got that wrong. And so we've we we always funded it with state dollars, but we always kind of said, you know, we're putting state funds into here to educate other kids. But now I with with this, I see that we are doing it. So correct my misunderstanding. Maybe I'm just flat wrong. Please. Mr. Chairman, Representative Larson. So there's the nuance there that I, I think we, we ought to clear up. So we have to, we we are we are mandated by the National Guard Guard Bureau to have a certain level of cadets participating in, in the program. So they're, the target for us is 100 um, each, each class is what, what they're trying to do. So we try to get, that's, that's our thing, we try to get to that level. If we take a student from a, or a cadet from another state, we can ask the state if they, if they want to pay for it, but they don't have to. And they, most of them don't, if they don't have a program, they don't have a mechanism to do it. So we don't pursue that very far because it, their attendance helps us meet those thresholds. So that's that's sort of the nuance. We can we have asked in the past, but most states say no. We're we're not we're not going to do this, and we have gone ahead and accepted it because we get most of our funding from from the feds on the seventy five percent, and it helps us reach that floor. I will tell you, we don't deny Wyoming kids first. I mean that we that we all our Wyoming kids take the the priority of that. We only accept uh, out of state kids when we need to to reach that that threshold. Does that does that make sense? It, sir? it it does clarify. What was confusing me is now that we're reimbursing other states for our kids to be there when we've not required that from other states when their kids come here. Yes, sir. M Mr. Chairman, to to uh, further elaborate on that, the three states that we have sent kids to would not do it without the state money because, well, I think two of them have legislation that they cannot accept kids and pay for them from out of state. And so we had to we had to pay the twenty five percent in order to get them to accept the kids into their programs. They wanted them, but they couldn't legally bring them. Anything else on Cowboy Challenge Academy? I've got a couple of questions. Uh, it 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 is a military program. There are there states where it go, falls under the Department of Corrections instead of the military. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I. I believe it is always, a, it, it's, I, I'm not aware of any state that has it under corrections. It's always part of the National Guard, although I believe there are some states that completely contract that, that program out. Um, it's under the executive agency of the National Guard in that state. So it started out as, if I understand, it started out as kind of a boot camp concept, but eventually you've got to have teachers and mentors. It, it, it takes a different flavor than just a boot camp. Yes, sir. It, it's always been, Mr. Chairman, it's always been the, the the focus has always been to try to get those young men and women a high school equivalency a diploma and what they what we believe and what's been what the program is based around is sort of a military culture and and that's where it came from is provide a little bit more discipline provide a little bit more structure and throw in the teachers on top of that to get them to the the high school um, equivalency but uh that that's that's it's it's been its focus the the whole time is is getting okay. that high school diploma and and is it even an, a, is it even a vehicle for recruitment or or the fact that they've been in trouble knocks them out of consideration the reason I ask is back in the day young men got in trouble they'd say well sign up for the army and you know charge it just, that that doesn't happen anymore they don't want anybody with a record now yes sir um, Mr Chairman that's that's true I, I will say we. We do get recruits to come through there because it's voluntarily and can't be court ordered. There's generally not anything in their background that prevents them. Although there's some that have taken medications that would prevent them to do it, but we would probably get between 11 and 12 percent of the folks would be interested in joining uh, the the military writ large, National Guard, or some other um, DoD entity. We actually would prefer that they go active duty because 
that takes them out of the environment that they came from. And uh, that's, that's actually often a good, a good I way see. forward for them is, you know, okay. is, is representative is Larson. Okay. Thank you. Anyone else? Anything else for the military? Who am I missing? I'm sorry, Representative Zwanitzer, please. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Just a question. And it, it relates to table 18. It doesn't have to do uh, necessarily with what we're, we're speaking about. Page. Uh, the table on page 18. Page 18, right? Oh, change that to 26, excuse me. Oops. And, and there's just a dollar difference in there. And by a dollar, I mean one dollar uh, that was taken from, I guess, uh, equipment and put into utilities. Mr. And Chairman? Maybe Mr. Hibbert. Kevin. Um, IBARS functions in the nature of if you have a supplemental request, then it opens that unit up for the budget book. We open that unit up by just transferring that dollar so that we could put the footnote in there for the Youth Challenge Academy. But that clearly shows that they're paying attention. We, we told you that I think we said previously that this committee has an appetite for details. So mm -hmm. There we go. Anything else for the uh, military department? All right, General, you want to give us a little bit of quick wrap up? And hey, sir, would that, uh, Mr. Chairman, thank you for that. I think what I owe you is a more detailed look at the marketing that that goes at that kind of gets to targeting about what more that you have, and I and I will and I will do that um, to make sure that we're tracking. I believe uh, I, I need to get a, some from uh, from uh, Miss Schultz. I believe is the, uh, the the name for the marketing because we're very interested in partnering with the University of Wyoming on that. And I will provide also the baseline Air Force funding for Civil Air Patrol just to make sure that we're all tracking it on the same sheet of music. So that's what I'm tracking as takeaway, sir. Thank you very much. Anybody else? Anything? Yeah. Thank you very much. And Mary, hey, Chris, sir, I do, I do have one more if I if it pleases. Okay, the chair. please, Doug, if you would talk that one very quickly. So, Mr. Chairman, uh, footnote number two in our current budget, um, as well as three, but footnote number two uh, provided five hundred thousand dollars one-time money for maintenance to the Air National Guard. Because of the way that the Air National Guard is funded, we cannot accept those funds to perform maintenance on the buildings that are required to be repaired with 100% federal money, which is unlike the Army Guard, which are on state property um, and a state responsibility. So we pay a portion depending on uh, which facility we're talking about, but like a, a regular readiness center or armory around the state, are 50 50. And so we would just like to let you know that we can't use the 500,000 for the Air Guard. And our intent would be to B11 that for the same purpose to the Army Guard budget. So footnote number three is 500,000 to the Army Guard budget. So, you know, that hearing that explanation reminds me of my father being trained as a cryptographer in World War II and being <laughs> shipped, shipped to India to be a cook. Go ahead, Mr. Co Chairman. Thank you. Um, so, Don, I think we need to refresh on what was that a typo or? But the question is, why would we move it to the Army Guard? Because we're already funding the Army Guard at some components of it, and that's just additional dollars. And if you need additional dollars, that that ought to come in your regular budget request, not just in a transfer for a supplemental dollar. Mr. Chairman, Mr. Chairman. I'm trying to remember back um, the Joint Appropriations Committee, I think, was was very interested in helping us out in the maintenance um, work last year. And that's that's how it came out was on those two sides. Um, I just wanted to let you know that we, we weren't able to spend it on the air guard side. I didn't want you to think we didn't need it. It's just we have no mechanism to spend it. Uh, obviously, we have a requirement on the Army side if if you wanted to approve a B-11. If not, I understand, sir. And, and but just understand it'll revert and uh, it's not because we don't want it. We just cannot spend it. It well, wouldn't be. I, I guess my point is we, I, I fund, we funded the, the army guard for what you requested. The, and we presume that when you asked for that, that was enough money to, to fund the army guard or ranching dollars that we did for it. Do you have an extra need over and above what you presented last year? Or can, is there a reason to do it immediately? I mean, this supplemental budgets are for, immediate needs that you need to take care of right away, not just add to, from one pot to the other. So. Yes, sir. General. Mr. Chairman, 
again, sir, if I, if I recall correctly, it wasn't quite to the level of maintenance that we requested. It was what the joint appropriations could do at that particular time. I will tell you, I, I can certainly spend it. We can certainly spend it. It's <laughs> not, it's not, it's not a dire need, sir. How much do we fund the, did we fund the army guard? Mr. Chairman, it's the same amount. It was five and five. So well, essentially we're doubling on what your request would be by doing this. I'm sorry, sir. We didn't have a request. Well, so you didn't have on the Army Guard, sir. Is that right? In, in, none of the, Do you mean there wasn't a request in the supplemental or there was never a request? Mr. Chairman, um, there wasn't, there was not a specific request. The, the discussion has been ongoing and continued um, during last session on the need for maintenance funding. And so that was the outcome of the discussion, not a request for an appropriation. So how much do we fund now for the Army Guard for maintenance? Don, do we have that number? Several million dollars. That's what I thought, yeah. <laughs> yeah, we're not gonna get that. Mr. Chairman. Go ahead. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. To restate what I think Mr. Shope just said, is that we had a discussion, they had a discussion, the military department with this committee, and this committee generously said we will do 500,000 Army Guard, 500,000 Air Guard for maintenance. It was not a request you brought to us. It was a discussion point you brought to us. We made the decision for 500 to each. Now you're saying in the Air Guard, you cannot spend it due to federal restrictions, et cetera, and you would desire to convert that over to the Army Guard. and then my question would be, is can we somewhat backdoor this back to the Army to where the, some of those facilities still get the maintenance we're trying to do, just do it through the Air Guard side of the budgets? So, Mr. Chairman, Representative Walters, to back up a little further, we did have a request in our biennial budget with a footnote to allow us to use major maintenance funds for routine maintenance. And that's where the discussion progressed that we didn't, we wanted to keep major maintenance money in major maintenance pot and appropriated dollars for routine maintenance in the, in the, in the routine pot. The answer came down that we'll give you one-time money. There was no discussion with us at the last minute when it was an arbitrary decision just to say, here's a million dollars. We knew that that million dollars was on the table, but at the last minute, it was just divided 50-50 between the Army and the Air in a footnote. Kevin, it's got something. Kevin, please. So, Mr. Chairman, the footnote says it shall not be transferred for any other purpose. So, is the purpose for maintenance for the military, or is it, are you going to make that specific to Air Guard maintenance? So, that's where the B-11, and that's why the conversation with the Joint Appropriations Committee today is, is that you've got this $500,000. How do we want to proceed with it? Well, if, if our footnote just said maintenance. It says is in the Army. Excuse me. This portion of $500,000 is in the Air Guard. Okay. And the footnote says shall not be transferred for any other purpose. So purpose, I think, is maintenance, or it could be black and white that Air Guard maintenance is the purpose. So there's a there's a defining point in there of whether or not the B11 is the correct instrument to be able to facilitate that. And that's why so, the Yeah, that, that's my question. Based upon that language, the B11 would be contrary to the language of, of, of the footnote. And so predicated on the strength of the definition of a purpose. Yeah. So we'd have to revert it. And so we have to either revert it or redirect the footnote. Correct. Correct. That way we're not uh having any issues with the semantic so of the I was definition of purpose. Co-chairman, as to whether you were disinclined to, to have the 500 moved at all and instead revert, are you okay with redeploying it to maintenance? Well, I, yeah, I think we have to have that discussion. What would, you, what would you use it for? And, and once again, revisit what you presented to us on your deferred maintenance. Well, I, so and I just need a little... Mr. Chairman, thank you. I just need a little clarification on that too, if I could. So is there a budget for maintenance in addition to the 500 
you have you have a budget. This just enhanced your ability to take care of some long overdue maintenance, as I recall. And so then my question would be, are we gaining on that? And does this help you get you back to where your major maintenance would, if we put this in, would it get you back to where major maintenance dollars would keep you where you need to be? Yeah. Yeah, Mr. Chung, we we definitely have the requirement, uh, Representative Larson, and, it, and if it, ple and I think we're, Co-Chairman Nicholas is going, if we showed you the plan of what we would do with that and those requirements, uh, I think that's reasonable and we'd be happy to do that. Mr. Chairman. Representative Walters. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And then to my final question from earlier, are some of these facilities shared facilities to where we can, if it's spent through the Army Guard side, the, the Air Guard still gets to benefit from the improvement of that, that routine and major maintenance yeah. factor? Yeah, Mr. Chairman, the only place is the Joint Force Headquarters, and it's a small footprint there. The rest are, are very separate on that. So, to, no, sir, you wouldn't get you wouldn't get that. But the uh, the Fed the Feds take care of the Air Guard pretty well on 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 that on on that side. Yep. All right. Anything else? Anything, Representative Stith? Mr. Chairman, just to revisit the Challenge Academy budget one okay. one more time. You may have already said this, but of the two point three seven million dollars that was a appropriated for this biennium, how much of that do you expect to then revert, if you know? Mr. Chairman, uh, Representative Stith, we do not know that because we're kind of in a realm of closing this program down and we don't know all the requirements. We still have staff with the major portion of the staff remaining until the end of December, but then we'll have staff that continues on until June 30th of 24. And right now we're in the process of divesting ourselves of, of a lot of property, um, as well as moving out of those facilities and still paying utility bills and so forth. All of the facilities will revert to the Army Guard's use and we have plenty of need for that on the Army Guard side. So- um, Further questions? Yeah, could you get us just a spreadsheet of what the total cost will be to continue this program through June of 24. So we know what's coming down on your next budget request because those, those are co known costs, I presume, are pretty close. Mr. Chairman, Mr. Co-Chairman, yes, sir, we can we can provide the known yes. costs. There'll, there'll be a delta, it's the unknown costs that we're, we're concerned about, but, but yes, sir, we, we got it. Anything else? Concluding remarks, General Porter? No, sir, I, you, you had me out of here. 15 minutes ago and I didn't take advantage of it. So I'm done, sir. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Merry Christmas and thank you for your service. Thank you. All right, next up county and prosecuting attorneys. My county attorney is not able to make it. We've got a, a sub from the bench coming in. I just can't remember who Tucker Ruby's sub is. Is that you? Yeah. All right, welcome. Any place that looks comfortable and accommodating. <laughs> well, we hope it's familiar from legislative photos rather than uh, wanted posters in court. Well, oh, of course, you can always, Bob Nicholas spends a lot of time in court. I hasten to add he's a lawyer. It's not for any other reason. That is actually correct. It's together for the state. So. <laughs> I hope it was productive. Always. All right, good. Well, welcome. If you'd introduce yourselves and uh, off we go to Department 160. Good afternoon. I'm Loretta Howison Callis. I am the Uinta County and Prosecuting Attorney. I am the Vice President of the Wyoming County and Prosecuting Attorneys Association. As you've noted, I am here instead of Sublet or Johnson County uh, Attorney Tucker Ruby, who is the President of our association, and 
you are most commonly, I think, used to addressing Joe Barron, the Crook County attorney. Um, I am here today to discuss with you our supplemental budget request for budget 160. Uh, in relation to matters, I believe that that paperwork has been already provided to you. And my apologies if I am not necessarily fully familiar with what we need to do, but essentially, just it, what you can do is just jump to that part of the budget that has your supplemental budget request and, and walk us through it. Is it one or it's only one, isn't it? There see. is only one request. It does address two years. So the fiscal years 2022 and 2023. Okay. We are asking for a supplemental budget provision of $755,355. I can identify how that amount has been derived. I will tell you that that is an estimate. Uh, the reason for that is, is because, as you are all likely aware, there are 21 county attorneys that receive funding uh, for a portion of our salaries from the Wyoming, uh, the state of Wyoming. However, the county commissioners present the number of deputies that each of us have. They are the ones who provide that, and the state is generous enough to provide $30,000 of compensation um, to match 60,000 or more. So no more than 30,000 for each of those deputies. And so our estimated amount is based off of 75 deputies. Um, because of our current market situations with employment, we may have less than 75 deputies and we may have more than 75 deputies depending on if we are able to fill those positions. I would say that the vast majority of our offices currently have vacant spaces. So in relation to that, then I would note that in the 2022 um, fiscal year, this comes because of the 2021 fiscal year when the state was facing those budget cuts, there was a significant cut in budget 160. Um, in 2021, sorry, the 2022, you did um, award a clawback uh, award uh, so that we could pay for the expenses in 2022, and that was a 499,250. And so this estimate is to provide for the offset in relation to those matters. That goes in relation to having approximately 2.1 million um, estimated to be needed for the 2022 and 2023 fiscal years um, in relation to uh, the elected officials and an estimate of $4.5 million to need to pay for the deputies and then taking that away from the originating balance. And so that leaves an estimated need of five point. So $5,844,645. So that's where the $755 thousand three hundred and fifty five dollars comes from have i confused everybody well, i'm, I'm going to depart from the usual structure can you just step us through how these things are funded I, you know I, I know there's the county we allowed county attorneys to get a raise but it had to come entirely at the county expense chairman kinski i i think i can probably address that okay. issue I would start by noting this supplemental request substantially doesn't have anything to do with the raises that were permitted in this okay. 2022 session. Uh, the statute has provided, and I don't know when it was originally put in, it was last modified prior to this year, I believe in 1997, but this last year, you are correct, in 2022, there were revisions to that statute. However, that statute has or has had previously provided that the county attorneys would not be paid more than $100,000 and that the state would compensate up to 50% of that salary. So up to $50,000. And then in kind that they would compensate up to 50% of each deputy's pay, not to exceed 60,000. So that's where the 30,000 comes. In the 2022 legislation, you did not change those calculations or provide any additional funding the differences in those raises that came for those that will come into effect on January 1st, because that's when our raises do come into effect, at least for the elected officials, uh, that comes from the county. 
Each okay. county pays for the remaining amount of the salary, our retirement, and our benefits. The state only pays the base dollar of up to $50,000 for the electeds. So that did not change with the 2022. So if we have a fixed amount, we'll contribute for deputies. It's a fixed dollar amount. And a fixed dollar amount will contribute to county attorneys. The 755 comes from what? More deputies? No. In the 2021 budget year, you the legislature substantially cut the budget 160, the contributions to the county to pay for these. There are two district attorneys in the state. I'm sure you're aware. Mm -hmm. They're in Laramie County and in Neshkrona County, and the state completely funds those programs. It would be a substantial expense to the state. I believe the most recent figure I saw was somewhere between 32 million and 50 million dollars to provide district attorneys in the remaining districts around the state. But instead, what has long been standing is, is that we have this budget 160 that the counties provide for us. And we have county uh, officials and we have duties that are assigned by statute as county elected officials to the county itself. And then we also do all the duties that a district attorney would do in our location. And so the justification for the state paying for the uh, a portion of our salaries is because we are doing the duties what a district attorney would do. And legislatively, for legislative history, I believe if you looked at that, then that would show that that was the basis many, many years ago on why there was compensation to the counties for our roles is because we are effectively your district attorneys in each of those locations. Senator Salazar. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. So I, ju I just need to clear this in my own mind. We raised it to 145. We capped it for county attorneys. If the county commissioners want to raise the salary for the county attorneys, it's on their budget, correct? Not ours to, to raise it up to 145. Chairman Kinski, Senator Salazar, Please. that is correct. Okay. Um, I will note that there will be some minimal changes, so I don't want to make any misrepresentations. For example, utilizing Uinta County um, prior to the authorization that went through in 2022, my salary was $95,000 a year. Effective January 1, it will be 115,000 because you authorized our commissioners to raise my salary above the 100,000. So effectively each year you'll pay $2,500 more towards my salary than you would have done the years before but it doesn't change the 50,000 cap. I wasn't making the capped amount prior to that time. There are still six counties that will not be at the capped amount that are still paying their elected officials less than $100,000. Representative Larson. I wanna make sure I'm tracking with you because I, if I'm understanding, it really hasn't got anything to do with the raises or the, the ability to increase the salaries of a, of a county or district attorney. What happened in 21 when we had the step two, step three cuts, we reduced that amount that we were reimbursing to the to your positions in the counties by this amount. The counties, if I'm understanding correct, have the ability to also fund up to a percentage of what the state does. And with the lower amount of state general funds, then that even though it's the same percent, it's a lesser amount that the counties would be reimbursing. So we're trying to get that money back into your system to where the counties can then fund a greater amount because statutorily they're limited by a percentage of the overall amount. Am I tracking? Chairman Kinski, Senator Larson, that is accurate. Uh, due to the cuts that occurred in 2021, then with the necessary cuts in funding, it essentially placed onto the counties a responsibility to pay 60 to 70% of our salaries rather than the 50% provided by statute. That is why there was the clawback in the 2021 and why we're asking for this supplemental budget now is to provide for the, as the statute provides you to provide that 50,000, but not for 50% of our salaries because that would be in a, inconsistent with your most recent legislation. And then, and the follow up, Mr. Chairman, but this is so where I still a little bit lost is it's one time funding. And, and so this 
Is is this just for a one time reimbursement? Please. Well, it's one time for four sixty seven. Yeah, one time for this four sixty seven. So, Kevin, Mr. Mr. Chairman, uh, one, one second. So. Mr. Chairman, I would expect to see this as a request in the 2526 budget, so, and that would request would be for a standard amount. So thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. So this just takes care of this standard budget need for this biennium. That's then correct. It'll move forward. Thank you. Got it. And Mr. Chairman, Senator or Representative Larson, I do want to make clear the supplemental request is 755. I think that the number you had was our number from last year's clawback. Okay, now, now I am confused. Mr. Chairman, their request is the 755 and the governor has approved the 467. So through the analyst of historical reversions and naturally they float up and down with the one-time money and the reductions for the step two, we expect that. And also uh, the fact that not everybody across all the counties is being paid to the max. And then also uh, in consideration with the fact that they experience vacancies and in relationship with the uh, review with the AG's office, we determined that the 467 was the correct amount of money. Okay. For the uh, Representative Henderson. Comments on the governor's calculation of the number. <laughs> Representative Nicholas, I would note that in order to substantiate payment, my understanding is the clawback last year was what was necessary. And so that would reflect at least what was in place in that time frame. And that amount was 499250 So that is reflective of the amount that was needed to pay for that. And that is a refund. So the counties and somebody noted that the counties pay ahead and then this refunds the counties for payments that they've already made. And so it, respectfully um, in relation to uh, information, I believe the Wyoming County and Prosecuting Attorneys Association likely has a better idea of where those positions are, what positions are available. And so respectfully, I would note that we do believe that it is most likely the 755,355. Certainly if we are overestimating that, as you all know, that would revert back to state funds. Uh, otherwise we may be here next year when it's not a time when it would be most appropriately before you saying again, a clawback legislation because we don't have sufficient funds to pay for those matters. And that would unfairly fall onto the counties. Mr. Hibbard. Mr. Chairman, everything that was testified is correct. There's one small caveat. The effective immediate was in the past biennium which was used and then for this. So there's two bienniums that were addressed in that amount of money. On the clock. So, yes. So we stick with our calculations. And we are sensitive and sympathetic. We'll have a budget request. We expect one for 25, 26. And we'll have the ability to do math and do an effective immediate if something of that nature is necessary. Mr. Mr. Chairman. Please, please let, let's let her go, Ms. Callis, and then we'll come back to you, Representative Stith. Thank you, Chairman Kinski. And I'm not trying to debate anything. I certainly am not a numbers person. I'm a court person. I'll be the first person to tell you in front of a jury or otherwise. I don't do math. It's not my <laughs> thing. <laughs> but what I do know is, is to provide an example, in my office, um, when I came into office in 2008, I intentionally cut two deputies from my personnel because of funding issues. Uh, we operated <laughs> off of those, but in the 2020 to 21 period, I had eight months when I had two attorneys in my office, which is grossly understaffed for my office, but we did not have the availability to hire someone. So when you are looking at the numbers sometimes for these reimbursements, it's because our offices are grossly understaffed and grossly overworked. And so it doesn't show the actual need that is in our office. And if, for example, right now, I have three attorneys thankfully working. I do have an opening that I have had since the commissioners approved it July 1 of this year. So I'm already working on six months that hypothetically we would be entitled to pay back that I won't have that will be billed. And that's just one out of 
21 counties that you have across the state. I have 195 active felonies that I personally am prosecuting right now. And so when I say that we need the help and that we are actively recruiting, I can't underestimate that enough. So while I appreciate that they know what the numbers are, what was there, I know that each of our offices is actively seeking help for the work that we have to do. Thank you. Okay, Representative Stith, please. Uh, Mr. Chairman, and my recollection of this debate before was, that, well, let me back up. It's my understanding that what this does is restore the <clears throat> step two cuts, essentially. And the reason we thought it was fair to impose the cuts before was that the counties, for example, were getting substantial uh, ARPA funding. So Sweetwater County, for example, Board of County Commissioners itself got $8 million, and we thought it was fair for them to share in the pain at that time. My understanding now is that by this 457, we're restoring that. So it sounds like it all, it's my understanding of what's happening. If anyone disagrees with that, just let me know if I'm misunderstanding the situation. Thank you. Anybody want to argue with Representative Stith? No, no volunteers. All right. Representative Henderson, you'd like to argue with Representative Stith? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'm going to decline the opportunity to argue with <laughs> Representative Stith. <laughs> Mr. Chairman, I, 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 my sense is that building on your response relative to what's going on in your county, considering the 21 counties affected, you mentioned a number of 75 deputies, so that probably is not fixed, right? I mean, there's there's a different situation most likely in every county, correct? And I would certainly defer to the state on the actual request. My apologies for parliamentary. You're fine. Chairman Go ahead, Kinsky. please. Senator, or Representative Kinner, uh, I, yes. So right now, hypothetically, when we're calculating those amounts for my county, we're calculating for one elected and three deputies. Um, other counties, um, Park County, um, I, well, I just, I, I could probably sit here and open up the Wyoming State Bar website and show multiple counties that are actively recruiting and, and advertising for jobs. So when those 75 deputies are what should be a fully staffed facility, and so I anticipate those reimbursements are not being submitted in that way because we haven't been fully staffed for years. Okay. Anything else? Anyone? Anything else? Well, thank you very much. Do you, do you have some closing remarks on your supplemental? Uh, to the members of the committee, just thank you very much for allowing us to appear. I'm glad to have been able to drive over. The roads were actually quite nice, except for a little fog this morning on the western side of the state. Uh, we do appreciate, I just want to make sure to express that, that each and every one of the county elected officials, the commissioners, my commissioners, as well as the county attorneys do re reflect and, and thank you not only for budget 160 and the amounts that you provide to ensure that we can be paid and the commissioners can pay us in a way that's appropriate, but also the legislation you did pass in 2022. Um, many of the county elected officials, as you guys already heard, and so I won't reiterate what you already went through, uh, in several counties, the elected official was the lowest paid attorney in their office. And so that has been able to be rectified by your actions this year. Uh, and so that is very much appreciated as well. So thank you for your time. So we miss um, the old days when um, now Judge Blumel used to come and do this for you. It's, it's nice to see you went to county continuing the, uh, the, the process. Well, Judge Blumel is happily sitting in, in Lincoln County, uh, Representative Nicholas, and, and we are um, truly enjoying uh, Judge Casty. So as to that, thank you very much for allowing us our own judge. We are, uh, I could probably talk to you guys for hours about what our docket was like, and uh, it is quickly getting back onto a schedule that is okay. fair and provides justice for not only the criminal system, but for uh, civil cases, which uh, I know that the people are very grateful for. Thank you very much and safe travels and Merry Christmas. Thank you to you all. The old days, the old days, he says. Attorney General here. Okay, so just a little bit of housekeeping. You're originally scheduled uh, 
it's changed. We're a little bit ahead of schedule. So you, you were scheduled for a half hour. You're now 150 to 220. And what we've been doing is, is brief overview and then get right into your supplementals. So sometimes we get distracted by talking too much and, and, and it doesn't do justice to you if you can't get through your supplementals. Mr. It's about swift administration of justice. All right, I, I have to step out for a second, Bob, if you can run the gavel. Introduce yourselves and you have the floor. Go ahead. Mr. Chairman, my name is Ryan Shellhaus. I'm the Chief Deputy Attorney General. I have with me Mark Clausen, who is the Deputy Attorney General of or the Tort Section and the School Facility Section. And I have uh, Steve Winders here, who is our Fiscal Officer. Um, Where's Bridget? I believe Bridget is going to join us via video. She got back late last night and she is um, very much under the weather. Oh, that's too bad. So I think we may be trying to get her here live and I'll, I'll wait a few moments. She would love to be here, but... Oh, sorry to hear that. Yeah. yeah. We like to pick on Bridget. That's it's no fun without her. <laughs> Just go ahead. All right. I I I am here. If you can hear me. Oh. We vaguely hear you, Bridget. Okay. I'm sorry. My voice is very bad today, so I'm speaking as loud as I can. Um, can you hear me? Almost. Okay, I will try harder. I'm sorry to have to not be there with you, but I believed you would not want my germs anywhere near you. <laughs> and so I thought I would try to attend this way. If it doesn't work out, I know that my people are prepared to answer all of your questions. Okay. So I do apologize for that. Yeah, um, well, Bridget, it's not necessary, really. I mean, we trust Ryan and company, but please get better faster, and um, we hope to see you soon. All right, thank you. You bet. Go ahead, Ryan. Right. Mr. Chairman, well, we are here with one supplemental budget request, which is for the law office to support the defense of the current school finance litigation. And, and as you can see in our uh, supplemental request, it's for a total of $358,174, comprised of $250,000 in 900 series for contractual services, uh, which could be made up of experts, could be outside uh, attorneys to help with our, with our team. And then 108,000, roughly 108,000 in 100 series for an AWAC position, a paralegal position. And um, as we've stated in our documents, we believe this requested funding will allow our office to retain the assistance of uh, outside uh, counsel if necessary to assist our team, uh, expert witnesses, and then for uh, paralegal services in terms of a, an AWAC um, position. And so that is our sole supplemental request for the next, I guess, fiscal year um, to finish out this biennium for a total of 358,170. So, so Ryan, have you determined what you're gonna do with the money yet? I mean, have you, how are you seeking legal counsel outside well, this legal counsel? Um, I, I presume you're gonna get the paralegal regardless. Um, and how much of the, the dollars of the, of the 250 are, how are you dividing it up is my question. That's my first question. Mr. Chairman, I think we have, we have an idea of how we will spend that money. I don't know how, how much in detail we want to go since this is uh, active litigation, but we do have an, an idea of how we want to spend that money and break that up. You know, we also have, as part of this biennium budget, we have $100,000 in 900 series and we're seeking this additional 250,000, which is- So are you, are you envisioning full-time counsel? I would, at this time, I would say no, because we do have a team of 
We have roughly two and a half uh, uh, employees in our office, Mr. Clausen, uh, another full-time attorney in school finance and a full-time paralegal. So I would say we would not envision you know, full-time uh, attorney. Give us a, a status. Um, have, have we have a ruling yet on the motion to dismiss? Uh, Mr. Chairman, yes, we received a ruling uh, yesterday. I think it was filed on December 7th, and the court um, denied our motion to dismiss in part and granted it in part. They, uh, they granted our motion in terms of they dismissed the punitive claim and the claim for attorney's fees. They denied our uh, motion to dismiss as it relates to WEA standing to bring the action. Yeah, so... Now that that mo the uh, that dismiss they've granted the denied your motion, so your answer is due. I believe our answer is due in fourteen days from the seventh. Okay. So one of the things that I, I and I'd like you to work with LSO. Um, I'd like I'd like to on our SharePoint. I'd like to keep a copy of the pleadings. So every time there's a filing, it gets it'll get posted to the Legislative Service Office. And so we can go to SharePoint and we can see the pleadings, uh, you know, and so we can keep a running understanding of, of what's going on, um, those of us who are interested in it. And then I, I don't know what, if you have developed a process or you and Bridget to report to, to either the LSO and or the legislature on as things progress. What I'm thinking is I'd, I'd like about like a monthly update as, as, as you progress on the pleadings that arrive and your commentary on it and, and probably set up some type of informal meeting with council. Um, and and I, I would think there's a high likelihood that the chief of staff or someone in the governor's office may wanna sit in on that so we can get regular updates as this thing starts to, to wind up and gets, and, and, and we get more involved in it just because, because here's, here's kind of the thoughts that have been going through my head. Uh, you know, we're, we're trying to decide as a legislature whether or not we're going to go out, out, outside and hire our own council. You know, if, if a, bunch, a bunch of other school districts jump in on this and all of a sudden you've got three or four or five or six lawyers you're battling, um, we want to make sure that the full gamut of, of the issues are being um, from all perspectives, because you're representing us, you're representing the governor, you're representing the state, but that's not... And on occasion, there are times when we may actually have different theories of the case or different components of how we want to broach different issues. And we want to make sure that um, those are being completely, the full gamut's being covered and not just what your office decides. And without regular communication, um, we would be more inclined to, to, to you know, to, to have just more, more guns and, and, and just more um, I mean, as you report, we're talking about hundreds and hundreds of millions of dollars um, that will affect our budget um, over the course of the next 15 or 20 years, um, depending on how this, this litigation matures. And the idea that, that we're not doing the best that we can all do and all work together to cover every issue and, and to have, you know, have a, multiple legal minds working on it. Um, that, that just doesn't make sense to me. So it's just an, and you know, we'd like to see some pleadings before they're filed. We want, want some input on it. And if, if we don't get that, if that's not part of the game, then, then we, we need, we, we're gonna change the game a little bit and, and we'll work together, but separately. So there's, there's different ways we can do it. Um, so and, and so I, I think that it behooves us to, to have an informal meeting about this kind of thing and then decide, um, let you guys think about it, digest it where you want to go, and 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 then sit down with with, with the gov gov staff and okay and, and map out a strategy for it. So, so you. Representative Nicholas, if I can, the the counterintuitive conclusion is that more lawyers makes for better outcomes. Um, on occasion. <laughs> <laughs> Anything else on the three hundred fifty eight thousand dollar exception request? Representative Schwartz. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And I think this is a question either for Kevin or Mr. Wilmarth. Um, but has there been discussion on the use of school foundation money 
for funding this in the budget. I mean, it's not just this request, it's the line item in the budget is school foundation program money. And uh, we've had this conversation in the committee in the past about when it's appropriate to use school foundation money. And I'm not sure this is one of those cases. Please. Mr. Chairman, uh, the precedent is established in a lot of the different agencies that we do use school foundation program funding. That is in ETS, the Attorney General's office. And I believe historically when we used to have that ongoing share that we had resident in the budget, um, that was school foundation program as well. I, I, yeah, that's, but, that, that's my understanding. Yeah. But my, I do have one more issue, question is, um, you know, between now and um, next year, you may have to retain some experts and do a lot more than $350,000. Um, so I'm, I'm really curious as if this, if this is enough to do what, what you may need to do and before you can come back in front of us. Um, Mr. Chairman, um, you know, it was our understanding that this would be a good beginning for this uh, litigation. And, and so we thought that this amount would get us through the next year and just, uh, like, as I said, a good beginning. So um, it's our intent for the next biennium and I think in the recommendation to biennial, we asked for this to be biennialized uh, going forward. So uh, certainly um, it's our belief that this will hopefully get us through, but you bring up good points with experts and if other school districts um, also um, sue also. So. Yeah, well, I think it's a guarantee. So, and I'll have a lot to do with Lots of definitely all these, there's lots of components of, of how this we evolve, but we got to prepare for the worst. So. Okay, anything else? Anyone? Anyone? Thank you, gentlemen. Thank you. Have a good weekend and a Merry Christmas. Thank you as well. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. I appreciate you want to go it. Take a break yeah. Okay, so it is uh. Two o'clock straight up. We have a 15 minute break scheduled. Let's be back at 2.15 and uh, we'll get on with the Supreme Court.
All right, we're, we're back on. Uh, we're now uh, welcome to the Supreme Court, Chief Justice Kate Fox, and a uh, little bit under the weather, so we appreciate you making the sacrifice to come out and see us today. The floor is yours, and then you can turn it over to your budget officer. What we've been doing is a brief overview and then trying to make sure we get through your supplemental requests. Mr. Chairman, thank you. Um, and I appreciate your sacrifice too, sitting through these hearings for several days. Um, thanks for your time. Thanks, I wanna say, especially to the outgoing members, it's been a pleasure working with you over the last few years. Um, and I really appreciate your service. Uh, and also, I got to mention the LSO staff who's been so helpful to us, especially Don. Thank you. Okay, Senator Kinski told me to keep it brief. I have to say my favorite thing, which is the uh, judicial branch is one of the three branches of government as opposed to an agency. We're here to perform our constitutional and statutory functions. And um, for a lot of those, we don't have the option of whether to accept a certain program or not accept it. Our job is to decide the legal disputes of the people of Wyoming, which seems like a simple thing. And maybe once it was, but it's getting more and more complicated. So that's the reason for some of the requests in our supplemental budget. Um, since you told me to cut it short, I'm going to hand it over now to Elisa Butler, our state court administrator, to walk through the book. And I also passed along your instruction to not even walk through every page of the book unless you have questions on some of the minor matters. <laughs> yeah. Well, what we found sometimes is we get down in the weeds and, and we don't do justice because we fail to get through all the supplemental requests. And so we really feel an obligation to do, do justice to the justice. I, Mr. Chairman, I share your appreciation of brevity. <laughs> Thank you. Mr. Chairman, Mr. Co-Chairman, my name is Elisa Butler. Um, I am the State Court Administrator for the Wyoming Judicial Branch, and I have the pleasure of walking you through the Judicial Branch's supplemental budget today. Um, I had an introduction planned, but I'm just going to jump right into our supplemental budget requests uh, at the pleasure of the Chairman. So our supplemental budget requests are summarized on in your budget book on page SC3. And Mr. Chairman, with your permission, this is where I would like to live as I walk through the supplemental budget today, unless you'd like me to flip Please do. through the book. Okay. Our supplemental budget consists of five asks totaling just under $500,000. Four out of five of these requests are ongoing. Um, we'll start with the Supreme Court budget. There are eight divisions within this budget. We'll touch on four of them today. The first request falls under the administration division and unit, which covers the Supreme Court justices and their staff, the Supreme Court clerk's office, Equal Justice Wyoming, and all of court administration. Uh, currently, because of the 2023 and 2024 budget, we were allocated three positions. However, those three positions were not funded. Um, I believe this, this may have been a mistake. We're not quite sure why we have them, but what we would like to do is have you fund those positions. Okay, so we are asking I'm for- I'm sorry, for just one second. I'm on page SC3. I don't see, am I on the wrong page? SC3, if you look at that very first summarization- It says court technology on SC3. I am on the supplemental- Judicial Branch Supplemental Budget oh, okay. 2023. Got your entire budget here. Okay. Thank my you. apologies. No, my, my Mr. bad. Chairman. Please proceed. Okay. Um, so we are requesting funding for those three positions. The three positions that we would like to fill would include a data trainer, an attorney, and an audiovisual support person. All three of these positions would live within court administration. Court administration provides administrative support to all of the courts throughout the state. Um, so as you all may know, data has become more and more important over the time. Not only does it help the judicial branch make decisions, but it helps the legislative and executive branch make effective policy decisions. 
data is only as good as the person who is entering that data, however. And what we have found is we actually we have a gap within the judiciary in ensuring that data is accurately entered into the case management system so we can pull reliable data out of the system. A data trainer would help fill this gap. What they would do is they would provide training to the clerks throughout the state in order to enter data consistently into the case management system. So when we need to pull reports or requests from the legislature, we know that that data is reliable. We're also working on collaboration with the other with the executive branch and a few of those agencies to ensure that we are sharing data appropriately. That includes DFS, DCI, Vital Statistics, and the Department of Corrections. So that is the first position. The second position would be an attorney that would again live in court administration. As of today, the judges really are required to keep abreast of state and federal laws that they, uh, they have to comply with and their regulations. Um, that puts a heavy administrative burden on those judges in addition to having to resolve cases that come before them. By having an attorney in court administration, we could take that burden and the judges would be better able to effectively and efficiently provide justice to litigants throughout the state. Thank you, Elise. I, I read that in your page three of three and I just need to understand the, me the mechanics of that. When you say that the, the, the judges have to ensure compliance, do you mean who has to be in compliance? Is it relative to a, a, a case they're hearing or, is it hearing or is it relevant to their district court staff and physical assets? I don't understand what they, what they have administrative oversight to see and then Help me understand how this this person in Cheyenne then is going to help relieve that burden. Mr. Chairman, Representative Larson, so the the administrative burden varies depending on the law that we're that we need to comply with, and it is judiciary wide. So, we, who needs to comply with? Who's we? Mr. Chairman, Representative Larson, the entire judicial branch. So just for example, if I can give you an example, the Please. one that we've been working on pretty consistently over the last um, six months to a year is the Americans with Disabilities Act. That is a requirement that all public entities provide services to people who are disabled. Um, and so when a judge has a person come into their courtroom who is disabled, that judge has to make de a determination what kind of accommodation they can provide to that potential litigant, a member of the public. And so they are charged with doing that in real time uh, without the assistance of somebody who can step back, really look at the case law and determine what kind of accommodation is required and what kind of accommodation they should. They should. Thank you. That helps. You're welcome. And Mr. Mr. Chairman. Helps at all. Page SC7 actually breaks the positions out and, and has a separate narrative for each. Representative Stith. Mr. Chairman, as a follow up to Representative Larson's question, um, is that really a full time job? I mean, you know, if the judge has to decide if someone with a disability comes into the courtroom, it seems like there'd be a memo or a playbook to deal with that, just making sure they have enough space or if they're hearing impaired or if they have visual issues. I mean, I, I guess. Is it compliance with federal laws? I and mean, those are the, the ones that are listed are compliance with federal laws. And so it's, it almost sounds like a human resources function. Is it, will, will this person function like a human resources department to say, hey, you need to treat your people better or you need to be in compliance with fair labor standards? Um, thank you. Please. Mr. Chairman, Representative Stith. So we do have a human resources manager who lives in court administration, but that person is not an attorney. Um, as you know, federal law is difficult and very complex. And what I would say, especially under the ADA, the ADA requires a, an ADA coordinator of some sort. Um, and what we have right now is we have those in locations throughout the state, which creates a bit of a concern in terms of ensuring that when a person who is disabled comes into our courthouses, whether or not they're being treated consistently when they go to one courthouse as opposed to another. And so what we would try to do is um, provide a statewide person who could provide consistent direction and assistance for those kinds of people. Additionally, for things like those HR type federal compliance statutes, you know, you have the Fair Labor Standards Act, you have um, 
Family Medical Leave Act, those present issues regularly and they are legal issues, not necessarily HR issues that we have to untangle. For example, who is exempt from the Fair Labor Standards Act? Who is not exempt? That's not necessarily a determination that you want an HR manager making. That's a determination you would want an attorney making. Um, and so those are the kinds of laws that we would want this person to look at, investigate, and then help provide guidance to the judicial branch as a whole, so court administration, and also the courts in each location as they face these issues. So the judges are not burdened with knowing all of the complexity of federal law and ensuring that their compliance. Okay, anything else? Please proceed. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. The third position is an audiovisual support person. So the, the state of Wyoming has invested very heavily in courtroom technology throughout the state, and that has provided a really great benefit to its citizens. Um, it allows litigants to uh, join hearings remotely without having to travel up vast distances. It also decreases attorney's fees because attorney's fees, again, are not traveling vast distances to um, attend a 15 minute hearing. They can now do that remotely. It also allows judges to cover for each other from time to time if they have a conflict without having to travel across the state. This is something that we need to protect. Um, it, as I said, it's provided a very good benefit to our citizens, and we are currently reliant on a vendor to provide that maintenance and support. If we had a dedicated audiovisual support person, they could be more responsive to the court's needs throughout the state. We do have bugs from time to time, and if we have somebody who can run to the court and help them fix their technology, that's always helpful. The other piece of this is the hope would be that they would be able to help us maybe prolong the time um, before we have to replace that courtroom technology. It is going to be a big lift at some point in the future that we're gonna to have to replace all of that. Um, and so if we can hire somebody who can help chart that course and also prolong the life of that equipment, um, it's, it's well worth the investment. Mr. Chairman. Please. Thank you, Mr. Chairman and Elise. So then the vendors currently in your budget Mr. Chairman, Representative Larson, I believe our vendor is currently paid out of our judicial systems automation account. So that is the special revenue account that we have um, for technology. So the yes, the maintenance and support is currently paid out of that budget. And that, that special revenue comes from court, Mr. Chairman, I apologize, comes from court documents. Is that record? Mr. Chairman, Representative Larson, it is a it is it's a filing fee. Um, so every civil filing, every criminal charge. Okay, thank you. Other questions before she proceeds? Carol, please. Well, on this, it talks about a cost savings with the, having an in staff. What are the current maintenance contracts cost, and, and how often are those uh, reevaluated? obviously have a contractual obligation with somebody to provide that maintenance and stuff. What does that cost now? And how long is the terms of that maintenance contract? Um, Mr. Chairman, I don't know off the top of my head. I could probably find that for you here shortly. I believe I have it. Um, and also Claire Smith, our chief fiscal officer may know that. Off the so, so you've done a break-even analysis of some kind. Well, Mr. Chairman, just the, 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 what spawned the question is the narrative says is that this, this action of this position will be a cost savings by the state, limiting the support and maintenance contracts with the vendor. Well, the, the proposal here is for $108,000 a year. I'd like to know what the vendor's contract is. And so just how much savings is there going to be? Mm, Mr. Chairman. Senator Hicks, it's my understanding that we have a three-year contract, $100,000 each year for that. So $300,000 over a three-year period. Currently, and then that's Currently. a two-year, and then that would be renegotiated, correct? And Mr. Chairman, Senator Hicks, that's correct. All right, thank you. Representative Larson. Renew the contract with the vendor. So you're gonna keep the vendor and then add the position? Mr. Chairman, Representative Larson, no. If we if we have a dedicated person to provide that audiovisual support, there there's there's still some maintenance type things that we would still need a vendor for, but it would be much 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 more limited. 
Anything else? Please proceed. Mr. Chairman, so for those three positions, we are requesting just over $356,000 for the second year of the biennium. We will need to biennialize that for budget fiscal year 25. The second request falls under the Judicial Nominating Commission Division and Unit. Um, so the, the selection of judges and justices in Wyoming is something we're, we're very proud of. Um, what happens in Wyoming, it's a merit selection process that's enshrined in the Wyoming Constitution. So when there is a vacancy that is announced, applicants submit materials to the Judicial Nominating Commission. The Judicial Nominating Commission is made up of three attorneys who are elected by the Wyoming State Bar, three non-attorneys who are appointed by the governor, and then the Chief Justice who presides over the Judicial Nominating Commission as the chair. All of those people are volunteer. Um, once those materials are submitted to the Judicial Nominating Commission, they make a determination on who they're going to interview, and they interview people in the location where the judge will preside, which requires substantial travel throughout the state of Wyoming, a lot of time for those JNC members. In the last year and a half, the Judicial Nominating Commission has performed 17 interviews in locations throughout the state. Um, so if you kind of work that out, that can be depending on where on the location of the judgeship, that can be up to three days of travel for some, some of those judicial nominating commission members. And if you add that all together, again, this is on the, the high side, but it's nearly two months of travel in that year and a half for those judicial nominating commission members. We're requesting $30,000 in travel costs to provide a more efficient and effective method of travel for those JNC members so they are not spending so much time on the road. Mr. Chairman? Please, brief question. Uh, the JSC members are reimbursed per diem, but not uh, paid, is that correct? And the per diem is at the same rate as the legislative level? Please. Mr. Chairman, Representative Wal Walters, yes, they are, they are reimbursed for their travel costs, but they are not paid. Okay. Other questions? Mr. Chairman. Please. Now, reimburse for travel costs, but that would include motels and mails and all that. Does the court follow the same pay schedule for reimbursement as we do for other state agencies in the legislature? And Mr. Chairman, Senator Hicks, it does. All right. Thank you. Okay. Okay, Mr. Chairman, I'm going to cover the third and fifth requests together. So every year, the State Employee Compensation Commission evaluates housing, housing costs for employees across the state. Um, in July of 2022, the, the commission um, proposed a, in, an increase in housing assistance for employees who live in Teton County. And that increase is $360 a month per employee. The judicial branch has a number of employees who reside in Teton County, um, three and a half circuit court employees, three district court employees currently. So we are requesting just over $30,000 in the circuit court budget and just under $26,000 in the district court budget to cover that increase in housing assistance for those employees. Keep in mind that this housing assistance does not apply to judges currently. It just applies to their staff. I'm seeing the 30,000. Tell me where the 26,000 is. That's mm -hmm. Mr. Chairman. That's you a will, district court thing. You will find it at the very end of your book on page DC3. Okay, so the judicial courts are allowing you to make their requests? Mr. Chairman, that is correct. Okay, it's progress. <laughs> Thank you. Mr. Chairman. <laughs> Mr. Chairman. Representative Walters. Mr. Chairman, just for my own education, why is it for the staff only and not the judge? Because the cost of living is still high there, and we set what they're going to get paid, which is cumbersome to say the least. So I just want to learn a little here. <laughs> Mr. Chairman, Representative Walters, I'd like to answer that. You know, the uh, judge's salaries are set by statute, and um, so the housing allowance doesn't necessarily apply to them. However, there is a bill, which I believe has gone out of the Joint Judiciary Committee 
to change that so that the judges in uh, Teton County or in whatever county that the uh, that is deemed eligible for a housing allowance will also receive it because I think you're absolutely right. The cost of living is just as high for judges as it is for their staffs. You got that? Any follow on? Okay, good. Well done, Chief Justice. Yeah. All right, uh, please proceed. Mr. Chairman, the last request is under the branch wide resources division and unit of the Supreme Court budget. To perform their statutory and constitutional duties to the best of their abilities, judges sometimes need a break. Um, it's a stressful job that requires time away. They're really good at covering for one another when they can, but when there's a prolonged absence due to something like a vacation, an illness, an injury, or a family emergency, that becomes more difficult for judges throughout the state. We're requesting for money, money for commissioners and magistrates who would help fill that gap and allow judges that time away every once in a while. The request in the, is in the amount of $50,000. Circuit court judges, district court judges, both. Mr. Chair, both. It's Representative Larson. I thought we had magistrates in play already. Please. Mr. Chairman, Representative Larson, we have a few full-time magistrates in locations throughout the state. And so those full-time magistrates act as quasi-judges in those locations where judges don't reside. For instance, we have a magistrate in Niobrara County, a circuit court magistrate in Niobrara County. We have a circuit court magistrate in Platte County, in Johnson County, and then in Bighorn County, I believe. So those are where the, the four-time, full-time magistrates. So they they essentially act as judges in those locations. Well, and, and I, Mr. Chairman, I yep. made me mistake, and I know some Fremont County attorneys who set in for as a magistrate for district courts and for circuit courts. And so that's kind of what I'm right or wrong. Am I misunderstanding that? And so what does this do where that's already in place? Mr. Chairman, Representative Larson, there are magistrates and commissioners who can step in for judges throughout the state. It's just that additional money would allow us to use them more frequently and allow the judges to take time away when they need it. Senator Salazar. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. How often does this occur? I mean, give me an example over the last 12 months, how many, how often that has happened where there, there is a, a need for a magistrate to step in. Um, Mr. Chairman, Senator Salazar, we had uh, an incident over the last 12 months. It happened, I would say, late spring, where we had a judge who was pretty severely injured. Um, he was out, required to be out because of surgery for, I, I think, two months. Um, and so that was a situation where a magistrate would have been incredibly helpful for that judge. Follow, Mr. Chairman. Please. And then when the magistrate steps in, is are they what at what salary are they paid that magistrate salary or the salary of the the district court judge or how does that work mr chairman senator salazar they are not paid at the salary of the judge we have a rate that we pay um magistrates and commissioners and i cannot tell you that rate off the top of my head um, i i am told that it varies between ninety dollars an hour and 125 dollars an hour Representative Larson and then Senator Hicks. So Elise, so then this fifty thousand dollars a year doesn't expand. I wouldn't think I would do we have magistrates so so these temporary magistrates that could step in. Mm -hmm. I'm assuming that are probably all the just they they're in all the counties or in all the districts. You're just wanting the ability for them to be able to set in for a longer period of time. Are they limited now? What is or in a, and are they limited by the budget you have? What's what's the limiting factor? Good question, Mr. Chairman, Representative Larson. Essentially, yes, we want more money to allow them to step in um, when needed. I mean, so as of right now, if we have a magistrate who needs to step in for a longer period of time, if we don't have the budget. We find it elsewhere, but this will help us kind of short that up. I mean, if we we have to 
move some things around in order to make sure that we can pay for that person coming in. Senator Hicks was next, and then Senator Walters. Mr. Chairman, what I'm uh, what I'm worried, what I'm concerned about is is and as we as we look at this, is is if we done a performed and looked at a workload analysis as to are we seeing that there's much more of these incidents where the judge gets up in the middle of the night? What I want to know is what's changed. Is is it is it been a significant increase of, of workload for these circuit court judges, a significant increase in time that would warrant this? So what I'm trying to say is how many of these cases did we deal with? How many hours of magistrate were used in 2019, 2020, 21, 22? What's changed that would now require the use of significantly more magistrates or commissioners? Is that a chief and, justice and, and is, is that analysis been conducted by the court? Um, Mr. Chairman, Senator Hicks, I'd like to respond to that <clears throat> if I can. Uh, in the last year, we have uh, branched out on a task force to examine the judicial branch, figure out how we can do things better, how we can be more efficient, and also how we can have improved job satisfaction among judges. And one of the most important findings that we had from surveys of our judges was that they don't get enough time off. And a lot of times, so when we're talking about magistrates, we're talking about circuit court. Um, Usually, if a circuit court judge is planning a vacation or even a few days off, they'll get another judge to cover for them, which can be done fairly easily by remote means now that we have this great technology for circuit courts. Um, the problem is that they're very reluctant to do that, and they say things like, well, I could ask someone else to cover for me, but I know that their workload is as bad as mine, so I don't want to do that, so I just don't take the time. So what has changed, to answer your question, is nothing has changed really other than we have discovered that it's really important for our judges to get some time off, and in order to do that, we need to be able to provide magistrate backup, so that's why the request for a little more money. Mr. Chairman, if I just follow up. Follow up, even though based on that explanation, it looks to me like something has changed from a standpoint that, you know, I did serve for eight years on the Judiciary Committee and, and this issue never came up. And the judges handled it through a variety of ways, as, as you described, getting somebody to cover them. And so something's changed, either it's just what I heard you say, not necessarily what you said, but what I heard you say is, is the judges today want to have the ability to take more time off and be covered and not have to bother contacting or, or in, uh, impede upon another judge's work to do that. It's the first time I've heard it. And so something has changed if the workload hasn't changed. Um, Mr. Chairman, Senator Hicks, that's probably accurate. I think the thing that has changed is um, that we have learned that just sucking it up is kind of using our judges up too fast and we'd like to provide them with some relief. The status quo is probably not different, but I would like to change it. Thank you for your candor. All right, uh, Representative Walters and then Representative Larson and then Representative Nicholas will just murderers row. We'll go right there. Chairman. <laughs> uh, at $95 an hour, I believe is what you said, you pay a magistrate. Will there be a struggle to find private attorneys that want to give up a $250 an hour job to go to a $95 job magistrate? I, I, I think it's a great idea. I think uh, Chief Justice describes it well that these judges, are, based on the number of judges we've replaced around the state in the last couple of years, is evidence that our judges are burning out and leaving the profession to go make more in the private sector and work less. So giving them time off is a good idea, but I fear that we aren't paying the magistrate enough to actually accomplish the goal of getting the judge more time off. So is there 95 enough? Do you think you'll find attorneys that want to step in and do this work? And just a little more discussion on that, please. Mr. Chairman, Representative Walters, that's a very good question because it's absolutely true that most lawyers it would take a really big pay cut to 
do this for 95 or or $100 an hour, we may need to pay them more. I do believe that um, in many communities, there are lawyers willing to step up and do this as a service, even if it is a pay cut. However, you raise another issue, which is the fact that in some communities, our smaller rural communities, like in the basin, for example, those lawyers aren't there. And that's a whole nother can of worms we probably don't want to get into today, but it's something we need to work on is to really enhance uh, the state's ability to attract lawyers to our smaller communities. Follow up, please. Do you think it would be appropriate to bestow honorary judgeships to the legislators and we could help out? <laughs> Maybe so. Representative, <laughs> Rep Representative Larson. Thank you, and, and Justice Chief Justice, I I agree. I I I think those guys, we use them like borrowed mules, and uh, and I think that they're very dedicated. And I agree with that. I'm just we're just the money guys, you know, when we're trying. So at least my question is: is we 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 had a vendor providing video stuff. We funded a an in-house guy, so we freed up $100,000 internally for you. And I'm sure that you've contemplated that. So you're you're saying you need this 50,000 in addition to the 100,000 that's being freed up? Um, Mr. Chairman, Representative Larson, I mean, I'm, I'm looking at my chief fiscal officer. I. I don't think in addition, I mean, I, I think if we, if that money was given back to the judiciary, we would, I mean, we would take that, but it is, if, if it's, and if it's at all 900. So if you want to give us a position and we can free up some money that way. Um, and Well, and but I thought I heard you say, Mr. Chairman, I yeah. thought I heard you say that the vendor that's taking care of your audio video stuff now is about a hundred thousand. That contract's about a hundred thousand a year, and you pay for it out of out of court fees, right? Mm. But now that's being freed up. You don't have to use that. Frees up a hundred thousand dollars. Mr. Chairman, Representative Larson, thank you. So the the amount that we pay our vendor in the um, out of the judicial systems automation account. The way that statute reads in terms of how we can use that funding would not necessarily be permitted to be used for magistrates. It's used for, for court technology purposes. My apologies. Okay, Betty, Thank clean you. up, Representative yeah. Nicholas. Um, so, you know, it's at some point, um, you, you're going to ask for another judge just because of, of the, the way the dockets go. And it's always been in the back of my mind a concept of. Your next, our next judge ought, may want to consider having a roving judge, where that person simply um, goes in and spends two or three weeks here or there, um, and it, he can actually do it both, or she could do it at both district or circuit court levels. But it's it's just it's a way to to free up and have additional time to get work done, to you know, take a vacation if you need it, or uh, to um, for various reasons. But there's just a lot of it just makes sense to me that at some point that that may be in our horizon in order to, to accomplish what we need to do and, and to do it right. Um, Mr. Chairman, Mr. Co-Chair, I, I agree completely. And I think this will be something we'll try to bring to you next year. Um, for example, in Idaho, they have a statutory set up for retired judges with, with enhanced retirement benefits as long as they commit to so many hours a year, a year, and then they can be sent where they're needed. We've done that informally this year in some cases where um, there were vacancies. We've gotten retired judges to go pitch in, and that's been a really successful experiment that I'd like to continue on a more formal statutory basis. We just weren't quite ready to bring that to you this year, but I, I think it's- and At some point if, when we fill the, the chancery position and it's not in full time, that, that person could do that for a while as well. Yeah. Anything else? Uh, Representative Senator Salazar. Thank you. Um, so time off, I get it. I, I, I would, would not want their position. It's a di difficult situation. 
But have you thought then of expanding the number of days for a vacation? Or is the issue finding a replacement to even take the vacation in the first place? Mr. Chairman, Senator Salazar, I think um, it's, they don't have a set vacation time and a lot of them just don't take one at all. I think the reason that they don't is because they don't wanna leave you know, a space or have someone else have to cover for them. So the issue is to say to our judges, hey, here's some money if you get a magistrate and you can take the time and then they're more likely to do it. So, so every district judge is their own department. By constitution, they're independent. So they don't have a policy and procedure manual. They don't have an HR department. It's a one man or one woman show. And so they don't write a policy for themselves that they have to take a vacation. They're just in there all the time. But on that line, the $50,000 goes to the Supreme Court. By what mechanism does it go to a district court, which is a completely independent and separate state agency by constitution? Mr. Chairman, you're, you're right. So the magistrate money that goes to the Supreme Court, magistrates are support for circuit courts only. So we're only talking about circuit courts. The reason we haven't asked for additional money for uh, district court commissioners, so under the constitution and the statutes, it's commissioners who support district court judges and magistrates who support circuit court judges. We have not asked for that support for commissioners for district court or for retired judges. We have a still a small pool of money left to use retired district court judges for district court judges who need a vacation for the rest of this biennium. So that's not included in this supplemental okay, well, that's budget. That's my bad. I thought at the uh, at the top line that Elise told me it was for both district and circuit courts. I must I must have misunderstood. She, Mr. Chairman, she may have said that, but she didn't mean it. Okay. <laughs> All right. It, oh, Representative Stith. Mr. Chairman. Uh, Justice Fox, on the issue of chancery courts, would you be in favor of uh, delaying for an additional year the uh, installation of a full-time chancery court judge due to the low volume of the chancery court? Yeah, Mr. Chairman, Representative Stith, I, I am in favor of putting it back another year because if we, um, right now the deadline for appointing a chancery court judge is, what is it, January of 24? Um, we would have to start that process probably five months ahead of that. And then, of course, once a full-time judge is in place, they would need a staff. And we're talking probably a million point two a biennium or more for that. And I and the number of cases that we have right now does not at all justify that. So I think it would be better to put back the deadline. We could still get a judge in place before that if the need arose, but it, it would be unfortunate to be forced to have a judge in place before there's really a good use for them. We want to save your money. Okay. Anything else? I'm still getting my head around the roving judge. It'd be the, the unknown circuit district court of uh, sitting anywhere, anytime. <laughs> Anything else in terms of your, your supplementals? Uh, Mr. Chairman, we have no other supplemental requests that wraps up the supplemental. Um, Mr. Chair, at your pleasure, we would be happy to talk about the ARPA request we have submitted. Okay, where, where is, do we have, do we have that, Don? Uh, Mr. Chairman, that is a, a judiciary letter. So it's under the letters on SharePoint, and I believe it, it was uh, circulated as well. Yes, it should be in your daily pile of, of materials. Everybody 
Mr. Chairman, while you're looking for that, I have to correct myself. Um, Ms. Butler did know what she was talking about when she referenced commissioners and magistrates. <laughs> I'm practicing that quite frequently. <laughs> I've got this is just this one letter. Okay. Well, now I've got two letters. I've, I've got a letter dated October 19th. And I've got one December 5th. Are we going to cover the October 19th letter? Mr. Oh, no, that's okay. That's the data trainer. Mr. Okay, Jay, that's yes, the same we thing we just covered. That's what we the just October covered. October 19th goes with okay. the supplemental budget request. All right, everybody, everybody on the same page. We got a, a letter dated December 5, 2022 with the... I knew there was a much larger ask somewhere. I just... Uh, good. Okay. Everybody ready? Proceed. Mr. Chairman, as part of an ARPA request that is reflected in the letter that you have in front of you today, dated December 5th, uh, Senate File 23 contemplates shifting the court supervised treatment program from the Department of Health to the judiciary. The judicial branch is supportive of this shift for a number of reasons. The first is that it's a court supervised treatment program, which would make sense that it would be um, administered by the judicial branch. Treatment courts, also known as drug courts throughout the state, are also very judge centered. Um, judges are generally the primary drivers of those programs. And also they have proven to be very effective in the state of Wyoming and across the United States. And because of that, this is something that, that we would put a lot of time and money to invest in and it would become a priority of the branch. Um, the legislation as it currently sits today contemplates shifting that from the Department of Health to the judiciary in July of 2024. So for the next 18 months, what we would like to do, and this is the ARPA request, is hire a consultant to come in and help us determine the best method to streamline the transition from the Department of Health to the judiciary, and also examine the treatment course throughout the state and help us decide if there are ways that we can broaden them and make them better throughout Wyoming. We also submitted a fiscal note with the bill. Um, I don't believe that is attached to the bill today. I think as part of that fiscal note, we are going to, or we have been directed to resubmit that before the first time that bill is heard in a committee. So we have, that is the ARPA request. Uh, Mr. Chairman, and I failed to tell you how much it is for, it is for $100,000. I'd be happy to answer. Any Don questions. and Elizabeth, tell me on the cliff notes where I would find this. I've got the letter. I'm not finding it on the cliff notes. Uh, Mr. Chairman, uh, it is not on that cliff notes, given the date of the letter is December 5th, and the cliff notes were prepared prior to that. Okay, I feel better now. Thank you. So, Mr. Chairman, just a real quick question, and I'm sure you guys have done your due diligence, but with those ARPA funds, they have certain restrictions on what we can and can't. And I'm sure you guys have looked, but this would be an eligible expenditure for those ARPA funds. Mr. Chairman, Senator Hicks, that is correct. We have worked with um, the governor's office, I believe, and their contractor to, to determine whether or not this is an eligible expense. All right, thank you. Anything else? I have to say this is very disorienting not to have a software request. <laughs> that comes after uh, you know, I probably shouldn't have jinxed it. Probably shouldn't have jinxed it. Sorry, pretend I didn't say it. Wrap up, Chief Justice. Mr. Chairman, thank you. On that note, I would like to say that we now have e-filing not only in the Chancery Court, but in three district courts with the fourth to come next week um, without any requests. Um, one final thing I wanted to say thank you for the raises that we were able to give to our judicial branch employees. Um, we support the governor's request for additional raises. We still have a ways to go to get our people up to market. And uh, that, just for clarification, these are the non-judicial employees of the branch. The judge's salaries are have not changed since 2019. Um, that's 
my wrap up again, thank you all very much. If you don't have any questions, we'll. All right, thank so, you. So um, just, it's, it's just so um, handy and useful to have that e-filing. It's just amazing how it facilitates things and time and expense. Um, it's, you know, apparently it can be abused on occasion. You know, if you get a dump uh, <laughs> the day before trial or something, but it's just remarkable. And it's it, it was a long time coming, but uh, it's just it's pretty neat, pretty neat stuff. So. Mr. So, Chairman, thank you. I, I do want to throw in just to, for the committee members and anybody else listening, I, Kate Fox, the Supreme Court Justice, has really done a tremendous job. Uh, every Chief Justice kind of sees the job a little bit different but she's following the example of uh, some really innovative and, and outstanding chief justices across the country that realize they may not have direct supervision over all the courts or the police or the prosecutors, but it's a bully pulpit. When the chief justice calls, people come. And you've convened now some conferences that brought people together from all across the uh, judicial system and, and it's yielding some, some fruit. And uh, appreciate it that it's it's above and beyond the call of what you originally envisioned you were going to do as as chief justice, but you've you've had an impact on the justice system that will last for generations. And thank you for all your work. Well, thank you very much. I appreciate that, and it's been a great honor. Our judicial branch is something to be really proud of. I think you should all be confident the rule of law is in good hands. But I appreciate the compliment. Thank you. Go home and get well. Yeah, I will. Merry Christmas. Robin Cooley's here somewhere. Yes, Don. Uh, Mr. Chairman, well, uh, Director uh, Robin Sessions Cooley um, uh, seats herself. This is an unusual um, request and it dates back. So I just wanted to provide a little bit of uh, context for. Um, why the director is before you. She does not have a supplemental budget request, nor is there a book in your door. Um, there is a handout and uh, a second um, um, memo, just in case you didn't uh, identify the first. It was dated back in September 15th. And you'll recall during the 10-day uh, review window for all B11s, uh, the Department of Workforce Services had uh, B11 number 2302, um, which was a $2 million increase in their biennial budget from a federal grant um, that was uh, related to a workforce development training fund. And uh, the chairman at the time, uh, Senator Perkins and Representative Nicholas, um, asked uh, to pose two questions of the department. Uh, will the new rules and amended budget authority result in a diminution of the Wyoming um, Develop, or workforce development training fund balance, and if so, by how much, and then also to provide additional context as to why the new emergency rules, including increased grants amounts, were pursued and whether future increases are anticipated. I just wanted to give you a little bit of background because this has been an unusual um, uh, departure from the supplemental budget request. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Ch Thank you, Mr. Chairman, Mr. Co-Chair, members of the committee. Robin Cooley, I'm the director of the Wyoming Department of Workforce Services. It's a privilege to be here. Uh, as indicated, uh, we're here based on the September 15th, uh, 2022 memo, asking some questions about the B11 uh, funding authority uh, out of the Workforce Development Training Fund. What I've done is uh, put together a PowerPoint presentation that's only about seven uh, uh, PowerPoints. And I think if we go through that, it'll answer most of your questions. And it'll also kind of explain the program, I think, in a little bit better detail and give you a little bit more flavor of the program. So if, if that's all right with you, we'll go through that. Like flavorful programs, please proceed. All right. If I could get that pulled up. There we go. 
All right, let's go to page two directly. All right, this is just a little background on what the Workforce Development Training Fund is. It's established under Wyoming Statute 9-2-2604. And if you take a look at this statute, this statute is so broadly written. Um, it, it, it really um, encompasses any training program that you would wanna provide to Wyoming workers across the state. Uh, it, and it does a pay for administrative costs, uh, development pro workforce development programs approved by the governor, um, training programs for necessary economic development initiatives. But the keywords that we looked at were train, retrain, and upgrade work skills for existing Wyoming workers. Uh, the funding right now is it, uh, the workforce training fund is, is funded through interest earned off the unemployment insurance state fund. Now, if you'll recall in several discussions we had last year, we have a, an unemployment regular fund. But this legislature several years ago, uh, very unique to Wyoming, set aside an amount of money into a state fund where th that fund is only, um, is only uh, used if the regular fund is depleted. So as long as that fund is there and it, it has uh, about 50 to $51 million in it that just stays in it and that's the routine amount that's in it. All of the interest off of that fund goes into what we call the 528 fund. It's that 528 fund monies that fund this workforce training fund grant monies. And Robin, if I may, that's funded by employer premiums, not the, not the state. That's exactly correct. Thank you. Mr. Chairman, yes. So these are monies. Part of it is state funded, but, but the 528 count, the, the funds that we pull out of that, that are interest, that state fund, these are employers' monies that we're using to then turn back around to train their own employees. Um, next slide. So going to the rules changes. What we did, and, and Mr. Chairman, I'm, gonna, I'm just going to go back to a request that you made to us uh, last year or the year before. You asked us to take a 10-year look back at amounts of money that we had spent in this fund. And we did that, and we quickly recognized what was happening with this fund. The fund was simply accumulating monies uh, because due to various changes that had been made to the rules, and, and, and nothing nefarious, of course, but changes made for various reasons, um, monies weren't going out for the purposes of the, of the statute. And instead, money was being allowed to accumulate into that fund. So we took a look at, the, at where we were after, after the pandemic. Now, and we decided now is the time that Wyoming employers and Wyoming workforce really need the training and the ability to upskill their employers. So we took a look at the funds. We took a look at what we might be able to do with that. And we started looking at the data to determine what amounts we felt we could really use uh, and, and to get out into communities for businesses and workforce. So what we did uh, was we, and I'm gonna ask you to maybe go to that next slide. That'll tell you what the amounts were that, are that have had accumulated into this fund. I, I, I was, stunned a little myself. Uh, I, I, you know, the, the, the statute doesn't speak to how much should be in this fund. Each year we get uh, annually probably about $1.1 million. I'm, I'm sorry, there's me. two, one, there's the fund that is the unemployment, the backup unemployment fund. The fund you're talking about, this fund is where the interest accumulates, correct? The, the state unemployment fund is where the interest accumulate is where the interest comes from. It is then placed into the 528 account. Okay, so when you say this fund, that's the 528 account. Correct. Okay, thank Correct. you. Correct. So these are the the monies. This is the accumulation of those funds, and it was it was very clear to us we needed to start getting some money out into Wyoming communities for retraining and upskilling. Uh, so what we did, looking at the data, looking at some of our programs, was we made some significant rule changes. Next slide, please. 
what we know and what we've all read, I think, is to retain your employees and to recruit employees is you need to offer them career growth. You need to offer them the opportunity for training. For instance, you have an engineer you need to have a, you, a, that needs a, a specific skill. You want to send them to get that training. You have a welder that needs a particular safety skill. You want to be able to send them to get that safety training. So what we did was we increased the business training grant. We have several tra training grants within this, this um, program. We increased the business training grants from $1,000 to $4,000 per trainee. For preferred industries, we increased that from $1,500 to $5,000 per trainee. And what we did was we allowed each business entity to have uh, up to $2,000 in uh, training funds per fiscal year. Mr. Chairman, Please. Robin, could you define for me what a preferred industry is? Uh, Mr. Chairman, Senator Hicks, absolutely. Uh, the, the preferred industries are decided or determined by the Wyoming, uh, Wyoming Workforce Council. The council has uh, determined those are construction, finance and insurance, healthcare and social assistance, manufacturing, technology, and hospitality and tourism. I think that pretty much covers our business spectrum, doesn't it? Yep. It pretty much does. <laughs> Uh, so there's a, a considerable amount of money going out to our communities in Wyoming for training for a lot of our businesses. Uh, the next uh, grant is our pre-hire grant. A lot of these funds go to our community colleges to help them set up programs for CDLs or CNAs. Um, I think we might have some tech programs potentially but there are programs where we know we have a need. Uh, we have a community college that has the curriculum that wants to set up that program. These individuals have not been hired into that program just yet, but we know and we follow them and, and, and ask that the community college then report back to us and they have a particular percentage that they have to work with a business in order to hire those individuals into that business. So it's a pre-hire. We train them before they're even into that employer, but we do ask for a certain percentage of those individuals to be hired in by those businesses, and that's been very successful. And what we did with that one is we recognized during the pandemic that we knew we needed emergency medical service providers out there in the communities, and so we added that into this particular grant. Another uh, grant that we had are our apprenticeship grants. And what we did there was we just adapted some of the performance measures there, be a little bit more flexible because we know employers are, um, the, the thought process out there with employers is apprenticeships are a little bit difficult to get set up. So we, we are doing what we can to um, kind of, uh, uh, help them out every chance we can to, to try to get those apprenticeships set up in their businesses because those are so valuable uh, to have. And then I want to talk about the internship grant. This is a grant that we started in 2020 right before COVID hit. An incredible opportunity for the state of Wyoming with this grant. It was really started uh, when Fred Schmeckel, who was running the Impact 307 over at UW, which is, uh, I forget, a business training grant program over there. It's now Impact 307. He was recognizing that he had all of these business startups over there and they were going to school and they were starting these business, businesses up, really doing a great job over there with some of those businesses, but they were busy and they had no way to real, grow their businesses. And he thought, you know, if we could get them some help with some internships, maybe we'll, we could help them start growing their businesses. It'd be a win-win for them, help them grow the business, but it'd also get an individual, maybe from the college, but maybe from the community also, into that business, see if they worked well together, get that individual interested in that job, and maybe we'd have a, a have a an in Wyoming. Uh, job for that individual and be able to keep them in Wyoming. 
And I can tell you, I hear from uh, business after business that has worked with an intern and they are routinely hiring their interns into their businesses after they've gone through the internship program. Uh, lots, lots of good things coming from that program. Okay, hold right there. I wanted to finish, Lloyd, go ahead. Thank, thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Director Cooley, are any of our state agencies eligible to participate in the internship program? Uh, Mr. Chairman, Representative Larson, right now they are not. We uh, specifically exempted them from the rule because we were concerned about the, the way that looked uh, with the funding coming oh, from sure. state. Uh, we've had a lot of discussion around that because it would be very beneficial, but it's a little, uh, right now, I'm not sure that's the right thing to do. Well, we're, Mr. Chairman, and, you know, particularly as I've worked with the Department of Construction and we look at construction management folks and, we, you know, we have a great opportunity to provide internships in, in other areas as well. YDOT provides interns. Mm -hmm. Others don't. And uh, I just wonder... Well, let me, Representative Larson, if I can if I can help out a little bit, I I, I'm, I I am part of the reason I encourage not to have government more active in there. Local businesses are not good at grant seeking; government is, and the fear is a fund that and a training fund that's financed by employers would just evaporate from all the government agencies getting in there for that money. So the focus is on the private sector. Okay. Thank you. Please Mr. Proceed. Chairman, Representative Larson, on that point, what I can tell you is with the pre-hire grant, what we did is help UW stand up a construction management program that has been wildly uh, successful across the state. They've been training individuals in construction and construction management across the state, and it's one of their most popular programs. So uh, we're helping in that area. We also, uh, in, a, in another area with the Workforce Development Training Fund, um, Workforce Development Council, we're working with what's called a next-gen sector partnership, where industry sets up their own partnerships in different regions. And one of those sector partnerships is construction, because we know we need construction workers around this state. And that's a very successful program. And they're working on that to build up that that sector around the state. So lots going on in, in that area. Uh, but just to give you a little more information about internships, I get kind of excited about this because internships are, are it. Internships would give us the return on investment from these funds that really can make a difference to Wyoming. I think an immediate difference to Wyoming. What we were able to do is increase our dollar amounts from $12 to $25. Now that's depending on the industry. For instance, some, some industries aren't gonna get $25 an hour because the industry doesn't support that. So we've got a, a range in there that we can pay them for that, uh, we, uh, supported by labor market industry averages. But what we also did was I, I believe prior to this, we would allow uh, two internships per business. We've increased that up to six internships per business. And we have had a number of businesses apply for six internships in their business. So it's pretty exciting to, to see that. Um, Mr. Chair? Business. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And I had to jump in at, the, at this point because I, I really support the idea of this program. And you mentioned, and I looked, and it's you can now go to six. When I look at the, the two charts about number of applications and the money that's going out, um, even that doesn't seem to explain the disconnect between the huge increase in the money spent in the internship program. So is, is that just because of, okay, you got the point, I'll stop. <laughs> no, it's, Mr. Please. Chairman, Representative Swartz, very good point, but, but I want to explain that. Applications don't equal number of internships. So uh, what, what you're seeing here are maybe a, a, an individual in or a business in 2021 submitted an application for two internships while the business in 2023 submitted one application, but it might be six internships. So just to give you an idea, I, I did get some numbers for internships. 
uh, internships approved in 2021 were 58. Internships approved in 2022 were 103. Internships in 2023, five months into it, are 242. Uh, so those numbers are going up. And I will, I have to tell you too, this is all being done pretty much word of mouth. I, I, I mean, we're all getting out there every, every chance we get to go out and talk about it in chambers, in conferences, in uh, down this, walking down the street, we're talking about it, but we, we don't have marketing money. So we're not out there doing a lot of marketing for it. Uh, uh, but word of mouth is spreading and um, businesses are, are starting to take advantage of it. Please. So then I'm assuming you're also tracking the data to see how many of these internships then turn into a full-time job. Uh, 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 Mr. Chairman, uh, Representative Swartz, we've started doing that. We, this is our, this is, we're, we're looking at this as kind of a pilot. And like I say, we started this right before COVID. So it really hasn't started taking off until recently. So what we're doing is we're sending out surveys after the intern is, is done to, to take, to get that very kind of information. So we can, so we can recognize, okay, if you, if you didn't hire them, why not? What can we be doing to help you? Um, uh, you, you know, what needs to, what needs to change in order that you would want to keep that, that intern in Wyoming. But again, it, it comes back to the brain drain. What can we do to keep these individuals in Wyoming? We can get them a job in Wyoming that they like with a group of people that they're interested in and that they, they get along with and they like. And I, I, I just think that this is maybe one of the, a, a tool in the toolbox to make that happen. Mm -hmm. Uh, so next slide, getting to the nitty gritty of the expenditures, what you really want to hear about, I think. Um, so you look at the 2021 expenditures. Again, this is where we were starting to take a look at the, at, at the money and starting to really recognize we weren't, we, we, we weren't doing what we should be doing with those funds. So the number I really want to point you to because it's the one that we're looking at and we're keeping our eye on it and we are keeping a close eye on it is the uh, number of expenditures approved total fiscal year 2023, uh, six, a little over $6.9 million. And you saw back here, we had a little over $9 million. What I want to assure you about um, with that number is this. When we're recognizing the number of approved dollars, um, especially, and the largest number here is internships at $5, five million, only about 50% of internships are actually following through. I don't like that number, and we want to get that number higher. But so, um, so only 50 to 60% of these funds are likely to be spent. We're keeping a close track on it, but I also want to make it clear to you in our in our rules, it's very clear uh, that this is a pilot program. It's a program that we are implementing because of COVID, because we think that business needs considerable expenses for at least the next two years. We want to get money out there into the communities to help them. At some point, we are going to have to pull back. I will tell you each year we get about $1.1 million coming back into that fund replenishing. So about $2.2 .2 million each year replenishes that fund. Senator and I don't, that, and I don't expect, expect that to stop. Senator Groom. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Hi, Robin. Um, on that 5 million, and I understand what you're saying about, you don't know how much it could be expended. But right now, how many, your mic a little bit. how many businesses have applied for that 5 million? Do you know? The number of businesses number of that are businesses. involved in the program. Yeah, we've got grant applications. I'm sorry, Mr. Chairman, Please. Senator Grew. We've got grant applications. I'm not sure. You know, we have. I, I, I signed these all, and but 
that's not going to tell you the real story because I know several businesses will file several different grant applications. I can get you that number though. We'll follow up okay. with that. Please proceed. So uh, again, with the money, uh, I understand the concern certainly, but we are following it. Um, I think we've already got a plan if we need, if and when we need to back off of uh, the money going out, going out into the communities. I think we're likely to back off in the area of the business training grants um, to some degree, because I think uh, the internships, I think are, are such a valuable tool uh, um, so, so we're making a plan when, and if we do need to back off some of this funding. Uh, so with that, I, I think that explains the program, it explains what our plan is and our spending and the reason that we did go forward with these rules. And I would stand for questions. Mr. Chairman. Senator Hicks. Not specific to your rules, but where's this money invested at? Is this in the state agency pool, pool A and that's the question. And then when you look at this, the account that you have, how much of that is uh, contributions and is there any investment earnings that then go back into this account associated with that? Mr. Chairman, Senator Hicks, that's a good question. I was asking the question yesterday, if this is in a 520, if, if this is in its own account, is it earning its own interest? And I, I, I just, I, I don't know the answers to those questions. I'm going to have to get back to you on that. I don't know. Mr. Chairman, and the reason is, is that maybe we don't have to back off. We it need should. to answer this question. If there's an opportunity, if it's just sitting there and not gener if it's just cash. Exactly. Maybe we ought to have a different strategy here and try to take this program and move a little further. So I, but if, if you can get that information to us, do that. look at that. And maybe there's a strategy there that we need to get done here uh, this legislative session too. So, Mr. Chairman, Senator Hicks, I, that's a wonderful idea. I, there's there's got to be a way to generate some more funds off of these funds. So I appreciate that. Representative Henderson, thank you, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Chairman, uh, relative to the five million, is that the total amount approved? And 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 then of that. Do you have any information uh, summary level relative to the participation by private sector? And you know, the governor in his message, I remember said something about more, more would want to participate if we found a way to incentivize. He, he mentioned uh, taxes, but there may be other opportunities. Have you seen any of those kind of opportunities in terms of motivating further participation? You mentioned needing to improve the level of execution or, or participation of the, of the approved internships. But are there other possible opportunities? Mr. Chairman, uh, uh, Representative Henderson, I'm not sure which, which 5 million you're, you're talking about. Um, it was the slide, question. Mr. Chairman? Please. It was a slide that referred to the total approved. You, you highlighted the amount and of the amounts listed, I noted that the one related to the internship line was the highest. So it looks oh, like okay, okay. of the six point something million, the five point something million was was internships. Yeah. So of that amount, what I'm asking is a little clarification, if you would, on possible opportunities to to further get more or to to to, uh, to, to build more value out of that uh, in uh, interest in that program. Mr. Chairman, uh, Representative Henderson, that's an excellent question. And what I would like to do is tell you this is our small but mighty group got back behind me here uh, that are working on that uh, that very growing program. If we could have check-in date, if you know, if we could have the ability to check in, if we could have the ability to check in with the intern to say, how's it going? Um, what what additional information we can we provide you? What additional resources can we provide you? You know, some some something like that where we're conti continually maybe prompting some addition, prompting the, the, the additional engagement. I think that we could, we could uh, do something like that. We're just, we're not there yet. Um, but you raise an excellent question uh, that we can th be thinking about. Follow on Representative Henderson. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. So on that point, of the uh, five point something million, how much of that 
has actually generated some benefit to Wyoming in terms of someone who would have otherwise gone to another job, perhaps outside of Wyoming, in terms of people staying inside of Wyoming for the benefit of Wyoming. Got an idea on that? Mr. Chairman, uh, Representative Henderson, that's data we're gathering as we speak. Where we're asked, we're sending out surveys after uh, the, the internship is over to determine, did you hire that individual? If you did not, why not? Um, same surveys to the uh, intern themselves. It, you know, if you didn't stay with them, why not? So, it, it, you know, like I said, the the businesses I'm talking to, I had I've had several people that had six internships, and they've told me that they ended up hiring five of those interns in their business because you you develop that relationship. And it's a it's a it's a, a career. It's an area that you want to to grow in. And I just think it's a way. It, again, it's a tool in the toolbox to keep our young people in Wyoming. So I'll just weigh in and with my compliments. My my role in it very early on is I received complaints from local employers who used to use the five twenty eight and the, the amounts were too low. It was too difficult to use, and. Um, I contacted Robin and and I don't know whether that triggered it or whether it's already underway. This rule followed shortly thereafter. And uh, we've got some employers that are delighted. It's not just that the amount finally works. It, you know, it hadn't, it had been cut substantially. Yeah. And they complained about, you know, how difficult it was to, to access. And this is a classic miscommunication. I had employers who wanted the training while it looked like the program was undersubscribed to them. And it was just because they were they'd walked away, and uh, it's it's I, I can tell you it's well utilized and shared. And I don't know what how it is pro rata. We had her crew up to speak to the Sheridan Chamber of Commerce to publicize this. We put it in the chamber letters, and I will add this: this is one piece of a much larger puzzle of what Robin and her crew are building. This is not your. Department of Workforce Services of yesterday just processing unemployment claims. I mean, they're very, very active partners with industry. They're working all across the, the university. They're, they're working with industry. They uh, Some of the best states, they have a Department of Workforce Services that monitors the critically short labor areas and then works with industry to project five years from now what those areas are going to be. Works with the community college system to see if those training programs are in place. And it's just, you're, it's just, she's just in the infancy of what Robin and her crew can do. I'll, I'll give you, for instance, we had a projection of labor force needs and it was Northeast Wyoming. And I called Robin and said, you know, we don't need any coal mine truck, coal mine truck drivers in Sheridan, but it was, it was Northeast Wyoming. So Gillette kind of dominated the data. And so she's going back for 2.0 where they're going to break it out on a more, on a finer basis so that. I said, you know, what we need is machinists in Sheridan. So uh, she's going to refine that data to make it more workable and usable for the community college system, for educators, for industry across the board. And I, I can't compliment enough what, what you've done. Uh, I was skeptic at first, I, as you know, uh, but I, I think you're doing a marvelous job. And I appreciate all the work that you and your crew have put into these training programs. And I, I, I hope you don't hit the limit. I, I hope others, other businesses across the state, other counties, catch on and, and, and generate more demand for this because it's working. It's working. Mr. Chairman. Please. I was just, with, with that explanation of the program, I was thinking maybe the director ought to put you on staff. <laughs> I've got some openings. <laughs> Bob, did you get your concerns addressed? The letter came from you and Drew. Anybody else? Anything else? Keep up the good work. Keep tracking the data and the outcomes. It's greatly appreciated. Thank you. We've got a great team. Thank you. Next is the LSRA training session. What's that? Gavel, or you to... What do you mean? Uh, 
Mr. Chairman, if, um, as uh, um, Deputy Williams and um, uh, others uh, address the committee, I, I wanted to perhaps give a, a brief update as to why um, this item is on your agenda today and refresh in folks' memory. This came also at a request of former Chairman uh, Perkins and uh, Chairman Nicholas, um, particularly from the September meeting of the Select Committee on Capital Financing and Investments. Um, so that's why uh, the folks are before you today. Number one, not all members of JAC sit on cap finance. So this is a, a brief opportunity for um, some education on the issues. And then specifically, um, the LSRA has a number of obligations that do appear in the section 300s of the budget bill. For instance, um, wildfire um, uh, uh, emergency loan, the group health insurance emergency loan. The Select Committee on Capital Finance and Investments does have a uh, agreed to sponsor legislation in this area and is uh, reducing or removing some of the loan obligations. And the individuals before you uh, today um, have a particular expertise on the administrative uh, complexity or lack thereof of these loans and the ability to forecast uh, the needs. We have, uh, I believe, Mr. Carroll from the Department of Education, who is the largest uh, recipient of uh, loans from the LSRA. Good, good afternoon, um, Chairman Kinski, Co-Chairman Nicholas, committee members. My name, what's that? Okay, yes. My name is Edie Troutwine. I am the Deputy State Auditor at the Wyoming State Auditor's Office. And as Mitch, Mr. Richards um, identified, I'm joined here by the Deputy Director um, with the Treasurer's Office, Don Williams, and then also Trent Carroll with the Wyoming Department of Education. And then behind us, um, the Treasurer's Office and our office have brought additional expertise if there are questions about the LSRA. I have joined by Erin Benskin from my office. She's the Accounting Division Manager. And then Katie Smith is also back there to answer questions. But as Mr. Richards um, said, we were called here today to provide additional information about the Legislative Stabilization Reserve Account. And so we sort of met before this committee me um, meeting. We've prepared some information about the piece of knowledge each of our agency holds related to the LSRA. And we can talk about those related processes, however this committee wants to proceed. Um, do you have a handout? No, I don't believe we do. Information in front of you. Okay, go, yes. go ahead. Okay, well, so I'll start from our perspective and then we'll go down the line. All right, so the state auditor's office, primarily we're in charge of the state's checkbook. So our office does have a, a role in this. Our One of our most important um, pieces, I would argue, is that our office is required to make sure that we have enough cash to pay the bills. So we monitor the cash in the general fund, which is 001, and the budget reserve account, the BRA, on a daily basis to make sure the state can pay its bills. Fund 001 or the general fund and the BRA are leveraged to float other funds that may temporarily go negative. So I've brought an example of when that might occur related to an account that Mr. Carroll um, monitors. So here's the example. If fund 009, the school foundation program account is about to go negative, the Department of Education notifies us, hey, we're about to go negative. We then start working with the state treasurer's office for a loan. Once the loan is complete, STO emails the SAO requesting spending authority in, to spend money from the LSRA, to provide the loaned funds to Department of Ed. We then increase the spending authority in Wolves and STO initiates a transfer of the funds to DOE. Then loan repayment activities are tracked in our accounting system. So that's one example of how our office is involved. So do you have data on how often that happens and how much so we can know what that flex is? Mr. Co-Chairman, I'm going to turn that over to Mr. Carroll to answer. Yeah, Mr. Chairman, Trent Carroll, Wyoming Department of Education. We do have some information and um, there was a, 
a report provided to the subcommittee, uh, Captain Ben, that shows pretty much a 10 year um, history of those loans that we've had to take out to cash for the school foundation program account, um, the, the history of that. So I could certainly provide that to this committee um, if you'd like that information as well. Yeah, I, but, I, I think it would be useful. And just tell us what it is. And, and if it's changed, particularly with now on our tax collection changes. Yeah, absolutely, uh, we'll Mr. Chairman. Modify that. Yeah, so it, it does vary from year to year, obviously, highly dependent on uh, mineral production and prices and the amount of local revenues that are being generated. Um, so over the last five years, I'll just give you the, um, the highest outstanding loan balance that we had at any point during the fiscal year. So going back to 2018, the highest amount was $50 million. Uh, 2019, $125 million. 2020, $151 million. 2021, $140 million. And then in 2022, 315 million. So you can see there's a pretty wide range there of what we need uh, to borrow to cash flow the school foundation program. So did that change at all um, when we modified the the payments for ad valorems or? Uh, Mr. Chairman, are you referring to the, the monthly collection right, of yeah. the mineral ad valorem? Uh, so we are still uh, experiencing that that change. This year is the first year that we've really seen. Uh, that that change uh, in effect. Um, so we're still trying to better understand that. Uh, it, it has, you know, overall, I would say that the, the improved revenue situation overall has, will probably be the, the biggest impact this year to our borrowing needs. So um, for the, the most recent years, we would have already probably had one or two loans at this point in the fiscal year. We haven't had to take one yet. Um, and so, uh, you know, re revenue situation is better, which means that we can cash flow from the, the 12 mil revenue that's coming in directly, the FMR increased revenue. Um, some of those other transfers, even from the end of the last fiscal year, have helped um, us get further into the fiscal year without having to borrow any money. And for, for the loans that you just talked about, those were all taken out typically when and how long does it take to get repaid? Uh, Mr. Chairman, it, it really just depends. I mean, it's we have low points of the year. We have high points of the year. So obviously November and December when we have the non-mineral property revenue coming in. And then at the end of the fiscal year, May and June are typically high months. Um, and then it, the low points can come at other times in the year, depending on some of those other big transfers. Um, we have revenue available to us in the common school, down O2 account beginning in January. So that can provide a buffer at the beginning of the calendar year for a month or two. Um, but I could give you a full schedule of everything for the last few years. I just can't tell you that it's a certain point every year because it does, does change. Well, and I'm trying to remember what the testimony was and the discussions about this in CAP 10 um, and where we left it in terms of... Mr. Chairman? So go ahead. And just so I just... So the folks at home, I'll understand this. I think I know, but I just want to make sure we have no question and ask. We're talking about all money that's within your budget. You're just borrowing it for short-term borrowing authority, but it's all money that is been and that has been authorized by the legislature for you to expend. It's just a question of cash flow, correct? Uh, Mr. Chairman and Senator Guru, that, that is correct. We have the appropriation authorized each by name in our budget. For all the expenditures, we're really just talking about the short-term cash flow needs because the timing of the revenue doesn't always align perfectly with the timing of the expenditures. Yeah, and, and that's part of the discussions we, we had during our that FIN meeting is how do we correlate better with our cash flow income versus um, the way we pay it out to match them up in a, in, a, in a different mechanism or to catch up with it in one fashion. Go ahead. Mr. Chairman, just to follow up with the State Auditor's Office, um, other um, part of the LSRA. So we do have statutory authority. We, the State Auditor's Office, have authority to access a loan against the LSRA. So um, in Session Law, Chapter 69, Section 301, which I think Mr. Richards uh, mentioned, that's where we have authority to borrow against the LSRA if we start to go negative in the general fund. I can report that that has never happened under the current administration. 
However, we were able to do some additional research and the state auditor's office did have to take a loan at that time against the SAP back in December of 2017. So that is the last time that we could find that the state auditor's office had to access a loan similar to what Mr. Carroll has to do when his funds go negative. And so it appears that at some point between 2017 and 19, that section 301 was changed to allow the state auditor's office to borrow against the LSRA. Again, um, just for more informational purposes, so that's where our authority comes from is again under section 301, but there's also a statute, uh, Wyoming statute 91417, that allows the state auditor as well as the state treasurer to utilize interfund loans from the LSRA. And Ms. Williams can talk about that more if you want additional information. But in summary, that's sort of the state auditor's office primary role with the LSRA. Mr. Chairman? Go ahead. Uh, briefly, how does the process reverse? So when uh, Grant is ready to pay back the LSRA, how does that process go about? Is it just an immediate reversal or? Mr. Chairman, Representative Walters, I might have Mr. Carroll answer that. Uh, Mr. Chairman, Representative Walters, so we work closely with the state treasurer's office throughout the year to keep track of all of our loans. And um, if the, the balance in the school foundation program account is such that we can repay a loan mid-year, we would do that. Um, but uh, in the most recent years, it's really just been, you know, any influx of revenue just buys us some time before the next loan, so to speak. So we haven't really paid many um, mid-year. Um, most of the time that's happened at the end of the year when we get some of those large transfers in June. Um, so the, the most recent years, the process has been that I would um, contact the treasurer's office, usually about the middle of June to start working on that. And then uh, we would figure out interest due all the way through that last month of the fiscal year. And then we would coordinate that transfer of funds for uh, both the interest piece at the, at the end to account for uh, the, full, the full term of the loan through that last day. And then we would also uh, submit a transfer for the uh, loan repayment of the principal balance on the loan. Mr. So is the interest on that, um, whatever the LISRA or SAP is, it would be LISRA, what, what is earning or would have learned during that period of time? Um, Mr. Chairman, I believe it's the prior year interest rate on the, uh, is it the state agency pool? LSRA. LSRA, yeah. yeah. Okay. Other questions? Go ahead, Don. I mean, and obviously that has an impact on how liquid the LSR is, needs to be. So thank you, Mr. Chairman, committee. I'm Don Williams, Deputy State Treasurer. So during the interim, the Select Committee on Capital Financing and Investments um, asked us uh, if the, there was any impact of these obligations on the LSRA to the way that we invested the money? And the answer is no, because what we have done and what you have done through um, um, statute in prior years is we have different so-called tranches of the, fun, of the um, LSRA that we assign for different level of investments. Um, 500 million of the LSRA is, um, is, is uh, assigned to a, a, a longer term investment strategy. And then the the one million the one billion I should, sorry I would say million one billion dollars has a more liquid investment so that we can meet these obligations as well as to, because it is the rainy day fund and so we take that we're very mindful of that that those funds need to be liquid should they be um, required by the legislature uh, or the governor to be used so what we what the committee did was um, undertake an examination of all of these obligations to the LSRA. And, in, and, and once they learned, well, I can speak in, not speaking for the committee, but it, it was apparent that once um, it was determined that this did not affect the way that we invested the LSRA, there was some concern about the amount of um, money that is obligated towards uh, from the LSRA for certain programs. And so the select committee then um, undertook an examination of those allotments, those obligations, to determine whether or not they were still relevant, because at the time, obviously, those those decisions were made for a particular set of needs. So the assessment was was made, begun to be made over: are those needs still relevant? And so we 
they, the committee was, um, took a look at that and then has a bill that it is sponsoring that does um, reduce or eliminate just a couple of those requirements. For instance, Department of Transportation um, has a, currently has a, um, an allowance to borrow up to $200 million from the LSRA should, and, and according to their testimony, in the event that there's a government shutdown, they want to keep their, um, be able to keep paying their bills um, before they receive their revenue from the federal government. I believe the bill reduces that from 200 to 100 million. Um, and then uh, I think this, uh, I think it's, there's one that was eliminated and I believe it's the governor's firefighting interfund loan. I think it was the, the 20 million, which was, one was it? There's one on workforce services. Oh, it was the unemployment compensation fund. My, my apologies, that's right, thank you. And so other than that, I believe the committee left the rest of them. There had been some discussion of the committee too. You've heard um, us mention the SAP today, the state agency pool, that's the agency cash account. Um, and whether a loan should be made from the LSRA versus the state agency pool. Um, the treasurer's office believes that we should continue to make, if loans are to be made, to be made from the LSRA because the state agency pool consists of other people's money. In effect, it's, it's agency funds, it's fees that they've collected on behalf, it's interest that um, is deposited there from the earnings on trust accounts for grants to be made. And, and so should loans be made from the SAP, whose accounts does that, who's, who foregoes that interest and therefore the ability to pay perhaps the salaries of their folks or to or issue grant awards um, in the meantime while, before that money is repaid. So we would like to reiterate our, um, that we like it just the way it is. Uh, we like the, the, if you're gonna make loans, not to mention the LSRA is the state's money. So should, should the legislature come and say, hey, we, we loaned last year $20 million for Fire A. If you wanted to forgive those loans, at some, at a, if a legislature wanted to forgive those loans at some point in time, um, the LSRA, is, you're, you have the ability to do that's your money. If you were to try to make, you, the, the decision would be more difficult, I would assume, if the, you were try, had made the loan from the SAP and, who, and you forgave the loan, whose money would that come from? Who's, you know, how would you be able to do that in effect? So um, those are, that kind of highlights one of my concerns about the SAP. And I believe that kind of summarizes the issue that we have. We, um, the, as far as an administrative burden, we issue promissory notes for all of the loans that are made from the LSRA, the ad valorem tax loans, the FIRA pension loans, um, school foundation loans. We go through a whole process of creating a promissory note so that we have an agreement between us and the other entity or repayment of that loan and calculation of interest where um, statutorily required. So it's not much of a burden, it just, <coughs> just sort of is part of what we do. Go ahead, Thank you, I'm just curious. Are there any recorded incidents of people not repaying the loan to the LISRA? Um, <laughs> Mr. Chairman and Representative Swartz, I can answer, answer that. So this last year was the first uh, time that the school foundation program account was unable to repay the outstanding loan balance at the end of the fiscal year, um, which made me a little anxious because I'm the one that signs those promissory notes and it's $160 million. So I'm thinking, hmm, okay. Um, but the, because we have that $100 million transfer that's required under statute to start the next fiscal year, you know, the, the process kind of works itself out there with the reconciliation. Um, so that's one example where the loan wasn't repaid. I don't know if you have any others. Sorry about that, Trent. Um, Mr. Chairman, we have had um, incidents where, and you may um, recall this uh, re recent legislation through um, um, the this committee, I think, for the level drainage district from way back in the 90s, where those when those things have not been paid, it has come to your attention. We had, an, and this is not related to the LSRA, but that is an example I can think of where an obligation hasn't been repaid, as well as um, the money that you appropriated last year for um, the the um, tax refunds that had been we had been carrying about two and a half million dollars years after years because of um, there was an overpayment that was made to the counties and the counties never repaid it and so then the legislature came in and and repaid the loan but as for the LSRA no we have I I cannot think of an incident we have not been repaid okay other questions any more report to do. 
I can add just a, a little bit more, Mr. Chairman. I think I went through most of what I was planning to share sure. earlier, but um, you asked about the, the timing of the loan requests. So just to give you a little flavor for the last several years. So uh, for FY21, we had a loan request in November and in April. Um, I'm sorry. So that's September, October, November, and April. And then um, for 20, FY20, it was September and March. And then for FY19, we just had one loan in August. So it really just depends on the year. And but it's all, it looks all like it's all related to school year and, and obligations that come up, right? That, that, that before the funds accumulate. Uh, Mr. Chairman, that's right. It's it's all dependent on the revenue inflow that we're seeing um, at the state level through all of the, diff the various sources that go into the School Foundation Program account, federal mineral royalties, transfers at year end, what those look like, the various tips, all, all of that. Um, it's pretty, pretty complicated. Um, so we, we usually um, work closely with the LSO staff to figure out what that should look like. We have an annual cash flow statement that we prepare. Uh, we meet with the treasurer's office at the beginning of the fiscal year to talk about possible loans and the timing of those loans so that they can plan their investment strategy around that and make sure that funds are liquid when we need them. Um, so we, it, the process, like uh, Deputy Williams said, has worked well. We coordinate with the, between the agencies and LSO and so my haven't had any issues. Is, what it, you know, it, it's, still, it's still a book capping, bookkeeping obligation. Let me just take, for example, you know, the... We're forecasting now a surplus on the education side for the next few biennials. And, and, so, and one of the suggestions is that we take some of that surplus and fill up the escrow. And then, and then so that would be essentially your own reserve account where you, could be bar you wouldn't have to borrow from LISRA. You could have an account and you, you could determine, we could determine what a good number is in that account um, so that you don't have to do this hopscotch back and forth. And I mean, the question is, does that, what, how, how much more would that facilitate what you do between the three of you on how this moves forward? Um, and does, does it make sense? If, if we, you know, the surplus dollars got to go somewhere and we all know they have to be spent on education, that that's the requirement of it. Um, the other, you know, the option is we put it in the permanent fund or we put it, put it in the pool A just so you get more interest on it or do something with it before it's, it's needed. But this may be a situation where it makes sense to at least have your own escrow account. That's kind of what that is designated for. Um, does it make sense? Yeah, Mr. Chairman, I think anything that can be done to streamline the process would be a benefit. Um, this hasn't been a terribly cumbersome process because we all work well together and we have the process pretty well defined. But, um, you know, that concept that you've described, it sounds like that would be a very efficient way to do it. So I, yeah. I mean, it would definitely make your life easier uh, and, and the treasurers to some degree. So, I don't know. Don, do you have the arm up? Uh, Mr. Chairman, just a, uh, a thought, and I'm not saying this would this would work, but the hundred million dollar uh, balance in the um, school foundation program is is fairly old. It's decades old. Um, you could potentially avoid a loan if you were able to um, allow them to keep a three hundred million dollar balance or something like that. It worth thinking. And just do it, yeah. So it's just a sitting balance. Yeah. That that would even make it more simple in some ways. Yeah, Mr. Chairman. Get your hand up. Yeah, Larry. What? Somebody. Thank you. Well, I'm going to go about this a different way. Um, have you guys have you ever thought about or just talked about kicking it around us about trying to institute policies or talk to the first identify what's driving this, <clears throat> whether it's construction costs at the end of the year or you know whatever they are, and and then try to figure out ways to lessen that because. Today, yeah, we've got the money, and so it's fine, but there may come another time when we don't, and if we don't, maybe start trying to just identify the low-hanging fruit to say, hey, think about this when you're doing your contracting, or think about this when you're doing your bonuses, or whatever it is. So, to say, I think I can answer that, and Don, okay. 
I could probably get the answer better, but the answer is the way we fund education, the money accumulates. And so unless you have a pot of money um, to come to, take, to pay those up initial upfront obligations for the first six months, it's gonna happen every year. So then is, it, is, that, is that a fair characterization, Trent? Yeah, Mr. Chairman, I would agree with that. Mr. Chairman, then to follow up for yeah. you. And then, so what I'm hearing you say is then it should fall on us to figure out a way to make sure that they're more evenly funded so they don't have the problem. Because I just, I, like say, I don't, say, I'm, I know nothing bad's happening. We talked about that. We asked that question. It was well, it's no. dollars in, dollars out. And the upfront obligations are higher than the, the parent. So the funding model has to kept, keep up with it. If we raise the the um, statutory amount or whatever that number is to three hundred million versus hundred million, that could fix it. I mean, at least in the near term, mm -hmm. it's just that simple. Yeah. Mr. Chairman, go ahead. So, Stu? on on that same idea, um, in the past, the reason we've had those cash flow issues is because the property tax and ad valorem tax gets collected once every six months, and you have to pay teachers in August, September, and October, but you may not be getting the money until November, December, right? So does, is that alleviated by the, you know, what we did with the monthly uh, ad valorem tax? How much does that alleviate the problem? Well, and the more I thought about it, the more that, that doesn't necessarily make sense, because we were just a year behind. So the differences would be raises or increases in those taxes over from the prior year for assessed evaluations, but the cash flow problem still exists once you catch up with itself. Does that make sense, Don? And well, that's because I'm not speaking into my mic. <laughs> <laughs> so Don, why don't, you, why don't you take this over because you're just better at these numbers than what we're doing. Mr. Chairman, I, I absolutely, absolutely do defer. The experts are, are there before you. But in layman's terms, um, the monthly ad valorem didn't only change on the minerals, which is about half. So the non-mineral still um, creates a, a delay in terms of collections versus outlays. And on the monthly um, uh, ad valorem for minerals, it doesn't help, in my opinion, as much as you would think, because there's still about a three-month delay between production and payment and then distribution by the Department of Revenue. So production in July, if it's going to um, pay for teacher salaries, that payment really isn't made until, say, October or so. So it helps um, that October and November, but it really doesn't pay for the salaries in September. So it still leaves a little bit of a gap. So in, in, in an even more simple layman's terms, if we increase that 100 million to 300 million or 350 million, I mean, that, the biggest number you gave us was 310, I think. Uh, Mr. Chairman, the, the highest outstanding loan balance was 2017 at 375. So that was a little bit earlier than the years I gave you previously. The question is, what, what's, what's the right number? Um, and theoretically, if you ever exp go past it, we could have a secondary cap to it or, or Lizer or some other thing jumps in. But it just makes sense to me that we... To simplify the process, it would, we, would, we would have the funds either this year or next year to do it with, with um, school dollars. So. Okay. So, Don, would you do a short little synopsis of that? And let's, when we have a break in the committee next week, we, we might entertain that as a draft bill. Okay, anything else? All right, wonderful. Thank you very much for being here and hanging out. Merry Christmas. Dawn's kind of Christmasy there. <laughs> okay, Dawn. A little recap for us. What's up? What's next? Yes, that, excuse me, Mr. Chairman. Um, next up, uh, recall, you will have uh, um, Department of Revenue, Department of Audit issues on Monday morning, um, followed by state lands, and then uh, YDOT will appear right after lunch. Their presentation, also scheduled for an hour, is um, very similar to the Game and Fish Commission um, and Department budget um, that you uh, heard from early this morning. 
And then we follow up with the state engineer's office and uh, closing the day with the Department of Health. Um, I believe it's the largest individual agency um, with uh, requests. You do have one bill draft, which you will um, you may consider um, on Monday. It's scheduled uh, just before lunch, and this is the state loan and bond program. Uh, you'll recall there were some conceptual amendments that were agreed to in uh, or proposed at the October meeting. So we have put those to uh, the language and Brian and the department, Brian Fuller and the department will be here to walk through um, that bill. And that, that new draft is buried somewhere in our files here. Right? Uh, Mr. Chairman, it is. It's also posted online and it is in the drafts folder on SharePoint. Um, if you'd like uh, our synopsis email this weekend, I can include a would copy. You, would you do that? Actually, why don't you just email the synopsis and the bill to everybody? It'd just be easier. Yeah. Okay, anything else? So um, as a reminder, I think we're scheduled to, to meet on Sunday at four o'clock um, for the House and the Senate for an informal discussions of, of our respective positions and, and kind of where we're, where we're trending and to just kind of discuss the process for the rest of the week. Um, and then I think, yeah, yeah. I, th I think earlier that before that was gonna be the, uh, the chairs and, and vice chair. And then at six o'clock was going to be dinner at my house for everybody, House and Senate. And then Monday we have dinner with, um, I think, in the governor's residence, just so everyone can kind of plan on that. Um, and I think that's about it for, then Don, just map out the rest of the week for us. Uh, Mr. Chairman, after uh, Monday's agency hearings, you have one more full day of agency hearings. Um, the, the primary agency is the state construction, and they take up essentially the whole morning um, on Tuesday. And then uh, some smaller agencies, Gaming Commission, ETS, um, Fire Pre Prevention, Department of Corrections in the afternoon. Um, most of Wednesday is um, related to governor's letters. And they're beginning in midday, I would say around 10 a.m., and uh, the governor's office has, re has requested that not only is the 10 to noon um, slot, but they ask uh, to extend that in the afternoon. So a fair bit of time uh, associated with uh, governor's letters. Unfortunately, we do have one agency, um, state parks. The only time uh, they could appear during the seven day period is Wednesday afternoon. So we'll have to go back and, and grab that last agency. And then um, starting at about 2.30 uh, that afternoon, Wednesday afternoon through the um, work day on Friday is your discretion. We have outlined a potential, you know, um, look at say the local government bill if you chose so desired, the ARPA bill if you so desire, Capcon bill if you so desire, or the state budget. And so you're thinking that um, on the on those single item bills, would you run through them with on Wednesday afternoon? Um, well, unlike all other drafts that LSO presents to you, um, there is no draft. So it's just based on, on your motions on the governor's letters and um, the actual agency submissions. I think the easiest, quite frankly, and, and I'm not saying easiest politically, the easiest for drafting purposes is if you wanted to add money to um, local government direct distribution, it's really two questions, how much? and how to distribute it. And once you conclude on those, we will then take your direction and draft it. Um, as to school cap or uh, capital construction, state capital construction, there's about 15 items. You heard about seven of them uh, this morning from the university. They have a, a large portion of those. And you can just walk through those and, and uh, agree, disagree. And maybe some of you have your own um, ideas as well on, on some amendments to that. Similar on, on ARPA, um, the magnitude of the dollar, about $100 million of requests from the governor, um, 13 projects, I believe it is. Uh, there's about um, half a dozen new ideas and a half a dozen um, enhancements to, uh, 
programs that were funded last year. Yeah. Yeah. Local government distribution. You guys figure out how much, and then we'll figure out how to distribute it. <laughs> <laughs> Deal? <laughs> well, we were thinking that it should be by whoever wins the vote. So. Well, we could do that, but you guys wouldn't have anything to do. <laughs> we'll go first to figure out how much there is. To <laughs> and so sometimes, I mean, it, it's sometimes on Wednesday afternoons we break and allow for the House and Senate to go and and, and work with Don and or whomever, to kind of work through the spreadsheets, um, run up the totals, figure out where we're to solidify the positions as we go. So we know that on Thursday there's more of a process to it and it, it, it quickens the pace and the discussions if you don't have to go through agency by agency, request by request, to work out the ones we can agree on and the ones we can't. But um, we'll, we'll... So Mr. Coker, I think that's a really good point, but I think in addition to that, it's going to figure out, I think back to what Don was saying, do we want to do budget first, Capcom, ARPA, I think that flow will be important just to make sure that we can feel like we're moving this ball down the road as far as it's. Uh, well, and part of the problem, for, part of the problem is that is because we're just going to get the letters on that Wednesday, and so to do anything on those letters, we really have to have at least a night or two under our belts before we get there. Some of them are simple, some of them are not. But. Yeah, and I'm not so much the letters as much as just the sequences. Is you know, do we do distributions first, and then do we do yeah. ARPA, and then do we do budget or the Capcom. I think that which one of those flows on time will just give us some thought. Well, and a part of that thought is what's the easiest for LSO in terms of coming up with drafts or whatever we we need to review prior to the end of Friday. Uh, Mr. Chairman, that that is an easy one for us. And we're happy to say when there is a uh, benefit. The order makes no difference to us. <laughs> In other words, they're not telling us. <laughs> go, go ahead. Senator. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Any further questions of Don or for anybody else? So we'll we'll be in recess until eight o'clock Monday morning. Is that right? All right. Thank you, everybody. Happy to have a good weekend.